All right, people. All right, we is back. We is back. So let me just check again that you can all um, you can all see me and that you can all hear me. Right. I've what I've done is just rebooted the entire thing. Now, without further ado, people, let's bring in from down under, Sheikh Kashif. Khan, un momentico, all right, look at that, just as I'm about to bring him in, the gin in my system, <laughs> here it is, ah, oh, salamu alaikum, sheikh, ahlam wa sahlan, ahlam wa sahlan, thank you, Mufti most welcome, it's an absolute pleasure having you back, see, just as I'm about to uh, bring you on, your camera is jumping all over the place on my screen, but yeah, it's it must be the gin trying to prevent your good work. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you keeping, Sheikh, during the lockdown? Um, uh, work and home, back to work, like same routine, different day, same work. Wah wah wah! Well, we've had an episode before. Um, coffee controversial arrived. We've had a very interesting controversial uh episode in the past people those of you that haven't yet watched it you need to watch it uh it was from our it was quite a while back actually probably what has it been about five months or something probably been about i think it was uh yeah i think it's uh, two or three months ago no i think it's been longer than that sheikh i think it's been in probably yeah. in the summer that we uh did that yeah. yeah so that was a very interesting very uh it, it required a lot of courage <laughs> <laughs> so welcome back did you get any backlash by the way since uh the last episode i'm out of curiosity well i'm i'm yeah of course and i think i'm used to of it like like if it's not possible that you say something and people don't react to it there's like whatever you say something doesn't matter it's religious or politics or whatever like you want to express your views people are always gonna you know there are people who's gonna appreciate you and other people is gonna condemn you anyways so that is natural you always have to grow thick skin you know especially when you are dealing with the Malvi gang so you have to grow <laughs> thick skin <laughs> uh, especially if you decide to come on a mind trap with Mufti <laughs> <laughs> yeah they, that makes it more controversial you know already hell yeah hell yeah so i hear people have been t t uh trying to warn you to stay away from me what's this about sheikh people have they have this uh controlling mentality like they don't want to you know uh, unfortunately it's in the religious people yeah like they want to decide whom you be friend with and whom you would be for for and your enemy and uh, they they have this controlling nature even the shiuks have this controlling nature that you can't speak uh, without their permission or on topics which are not approved by your seniors or by your peace or by your madrasa so yeah um it's the culture, unfortunately, yeah, and it's inevitable. Can't do anything about that. Right. What about out of curiosity? You know, the last topic we discussed, Sheikh, it was uh, very controversial. Um, you know, discussing things like uh, pornography, discussing stuff like uh, masturbation. What about those topics? Did you get any backlash from these topics, or not really? Uh, I do get it, but I ignore it. Like, I'm more focused on what I'm doing. Like, I don't have any time to, you know, entertain everyone. Mm. Um, I just keep writing, keep reading, and keep sharing. Because if I'm going to, you know, engage with ev everyone or respond uh, respond everyone, then I'm going to be wasting my time. Because I have a very li limited time uh, after my work and after, you know, giving my time to the family and doing home chores. And after that, I get time to study. So I don't really like uh, entertain them these people so i'm more focused what i'm doing and i keep doing that because um, it's a waste of time 
because that's what they want. They want your attention. So it's better to ignore them and keep working. Yeah, unless if someone refutes you, then definitely you should reply. Mm. If it's an academic refutation, not a, not a personal attack, then definitely you can engage with the argument. But uh, if, if it's a personal attack, and, um, uh, jealousy and hatred and uh, swearing at you and mm. uh, hurling fatwas of kufr and things like that, then I then I ignore it. I don't... Um, yeah. what, why, Sheikh, this jealousy... Do you feel it's a bit extra in the religious circles? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, unfortunately, it is. Um, like a few, um, I think people sugarcoat a lot of things. Uh, see, after the Prophet, there's no one infallible. People sugarcoat a lot about Sahaba and the Salaf. Even if you see amongst them, uh, um, see the controversies, um, how they reacted with each other, calling each other the Jal, and sometimes I'm not saying they were all like that, but still they had these personal jealousies and uh, they are incidents like the uh, how uh, what happened with Ibn Jarir Tabri, okay. the hum the humbleies they did not allow him to be buried in the day, and they were uh, you know uh, they got enraged because mm. he did not consider Ahmad Ibn Hanbal to be a fucky a jurist. No. So they were enraged on his comments. And then there was, if you see Ibn Jawzi, Ibn Jawzi is criticizing Khatib Baghdadi and others for not considering Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal to be a faqi. And these things, even Imam Ghazali, uh, whom the Sufis revere, revere so much, yeah. um, whether it's the Hanfi Sufis or um, Braille, Deobandis, all of them, but Imam Ghazali, he do not consider Imam Abu Hanifa to be a mushtahid. Imam Ghazali. He says it openly. Yeah, Imam Ghazali says Abu Hanifa was not a mushtahid. He did not know Arabic language. He couldn't. Um, um, he didn't know any hadith. He did not know any Quran. And um, so uh, it is. Uh, even Abdul Qadir Jalani, he in the seventy-two misguided sects, uh, yeah. who um, who will go to the Jahannam, he mentioned Hanafis. He named them and said Hanafis are amongst the sect who will go to Jahannam. So uh, Abdul Qadir Jalani was a humbly and he was revered by Sufis. He's revered by Sufis, including the Hanfi Sufis. But most people, they don't r read his own book. So, but these things were amongst them. Like they, um, even though they were scholars, they were very upright and right pious people, but they still had this fanaticism, extremism in them. And uh, that's why when I say that, when we sugarcoat uh, scholars and um, you know salaf, so we should be we should be more balanced about them. We should tell people that they're human beings. They are infallible. They are not free from mistakes. Because when you portray them as infallible and um, sugarcoat everything, so them, when someone come across these things, he gets uh, confused. That I have like people tell them that they were all peace loving and uh, they had harmony amongst them. But they were humans, and they had these natural things amongst them, like hating each other and you know, on fighting with each other. This this is normal human uh, nature. This is from the nature of humans. They <laughs> sometimes they misunderstand each other, and the, the things happen. What I'm saying is, these things were there in the past as well. We should not ignore that. So when people react these this mm -hmm. way, so there is a precedence. On, on I know that the. Um... You know, uh, with the Hanafiya thing, the on Abdul Qadir Al Jilani's book where he mentions the Hanafiya, the Hanafiya try to say, oh, he's referring to some particular sect, which were the Hanafiya, not us as the Hanafiya. Abdul, the, the easy way to answer is that that um, uh, Abdul Qadir Jilani was a humbly, and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal he said that uh, to his companions, you know, if you curse Abu Hanifa, you will get reward. He said to his students, this is all, all, did he say that? Proven from him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is it's in his Masail. In his and uh, his son and others, other uh, of his students reported from him. Mm. So, like what you, uh, okay, we, I, I do not tell this uh, to the, in the common public. And I'm, I'm sure that, um, like, people who is watching your show should be, like, more above that level yeah. of that common Hopefully, level. people, so, I don't, you better yeah, rise above that yeah. level. Because when people tell me, do not narrate these masail, people are going to, I, I say to them, you can unfriend me. You, you should not listen to me. Why are you listening to me? Uh, you should go and listen 
to Marik Jamil or you know the scholars who sugar coat everything. So you know, if you want to be uh, wanna live in the Lala's land, so you can go and uh, watch Tariq Jamil videos, and you should. Uh, mm-hmm. He's gonna tell you everything is. You should. Uh, you should be watching the Disney right. Channel. The Disney Channel. Yeah, watch something where you don't want to. Don't watch Sheikh Kashif unless you're ready for Kashif. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean if you're talking academically, then you have to understand these things. You cannot. just lie let to people like mm-hmm. everything was fine and there was no uh, things did not change after the prophet and uh, they were all in harmony and peace these these are the lies which uh, people tell and unfortunately some of them are also not aware of these things i have seen a lot of scholars among these they just parrot the same thing what they have been told in the in their madrasa and they don't really read the book themselves right so mm-hmm. if you read the books you'll get to know that these uh, how they treated each other and how they uh think did things like that what what you see are you you're talking about the salaf in general or are you talking about yes salaf and the scholars after them and uh yeah okay yeah, i see <laughs> but i mean i mean I, what what my point sorry to interrupt you what my point is they were humans right so we should not sugar coat that they were some kind of infallible people they couldn't make mistakes and they did not have these personal jealousies and they were free from mistakes so we have to be you know um, we should keep a balanced approach about them as humans mm. so when people do these things so i'm not uh, i'm not get i'm not surprised because uh, that 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 is the natural reaction they do with each other Sure, you know somebody had asked me just on uh, yesterday's Monday nights with Mufti that from all the Salafi or the Ahl Hadith scholars you seem to get on with Sheikh Kashif, and I was like, "Wow!" You know, I said, "Well, you don't." You see, there's there's a certain there's a a a I I don't know whether it's a a strain within the ahl hadith who are people inclined towards the voice of reason and of the voice of reason themselves i mean within the ahl hadith especially of india what are your thoughts on that sheikh especially uh since the ahl hadith of india do not mirror the salafi movement of arabia it's not a mirror reflection yeah it is um and uh, a lot of uh, if you read the early scholars like kazi shaukani allama nawaz siddiq hasan khan mian nadir hussain dehelvi shamsul azik uh, shamsul haq azim abadi sanan amritsari muhaddis ropadi and these scholars they were very different from the najad scholars uh, they did not even make tafsir on ahmed raza khan barelvi who mm-hmm. who supported istighatha wasila tawassul issues like that which was shirk shirk akbar to them and on the contrary the najdi ulama they made takfir on everyone they considered their blood is permissible their wealth is permissible they are now become they have become apostates and they need and they kill people as well so uh, and uh, uh, even allama albani he's from the, um, the, the scholars who was after these um, in indo pak scholars allama albani himself said as uh, muhammad bin abdul wahab had extremism in him he was not profound in fiqh and uh, issues like yeah. that of sharia i mean i but he, what are you because yeah. i've not felt I, i i don't know your stance on this but so it's a bit risky asking you online on air but i uh, about muhammad ibn abdul wahab i've personally not felt that he was that clued up in things like uh, you know as an islamic scholar he was just mediocre he was not something special that <laughs> that's been my i don't know how you feel about it. do you feel he's uh because I, <laughs> unless hey, you, um, you you uh, do rate him quite a bit I yeah uh, about mohammed abdul wahab um i think uh, even kazi shakani called out on him and uh, uh, nawab siddiq hasan khan as well for because he had this tendency to us uh, uh, to us khawarish type uh, thinking mm-hmm. you know uh to our execution of people killing them and making takfir uh, instantly and declaring everyone as kafir or apostate to whoever does not agree with him mm-hmm. so yeah he was kind of and he was like i would i'd say mohammed bin abdul wahab and ahmed al-khan barelvi 
they are the uh, they are two different sides of the same coin Achha. if you see hmm. if you see the obandi uh, if you see the uh, deobandi scholars like ashraf ali thanvi or uh, although i'm not a fan of deobandi scholars i do criticize criticize them a lot but mm. uh, if you compare the in- indian pakistani uh, ahle hadith scholars and uh, and the deobandi scholars they are totally different from mohammed bin abdul wahab and uh, ahmed al zafan bareli because these two figures made the fear on everyone like they just declared people kafir 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 and, kafir and yeah happy. kafir <laughs> so yeah and uh, were... yeah i mean because i felt that you know muhammad ibn Abd, uh, ibn abdul wahab like i felt we i mean without i'm not trying to be rude <laughs> or maybe i am to many people but i'm not where is the ilm like i just see him as mediocre i'm not going to lie i i would think yaar i i would run rings around him <laughs> <laughs> but but do do the ahlul hadith of india rate muhammad ibn abdul wahab they respect him as a scholar but the senior scholars within the circle if you sit with them and if they know you are a person who would not spill the beans in the public they discuss in the room that he was kind of a bit of a fanatic scholar and mm. he went to extreme even i'm not naming the scholars but there are certain scholars even today who are alive they just uh, uh, the senior scholars and they uh, they say and admit that mohammed abdul khab approach and things what he did were like um, he just crossed his limits and we we don't do these things like in india pakistan and especially there are some um, scholars uh, who are the students of usaimin and sheikh ibn bas in pakistan because they often go to saudi arabia they get funding and go to madina university mm. so they they uh, among them among their teachers also also like najdi scholars so they in their private gatherings they said that barel these are kafir they are mushrik apostates so but in public uh, some of them uh, they don't say it openly because they, because barel these are in majority mm. and they are going to get backlash Uh, definitely yeah, of course. so once uh, 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 alay this scholar in lahore he said that fatwa of uh, ibn abbas at barelvi are apostates and barelvi attacked his masjid so he couldn't go out of his house for few days mm-hmm. and the reason why he got saved because he he belonged to a militant group that uh, mufti so he just got saved otherwise he would have been you know killed or people would have just um, mm. yeah yeah i can imagine i can imagine Right another thing that um you have spoken about quite a bit Sheikh uh, especially recently and it's something not spoken about so much in the uh, especially the Indo Pak circles or the uh Ahl Hadith circles and that is uh things on women's rights and it's and I know one of the issues that got uh quite I don't know reasonably controversial is shared space between the genders and so when yeah. you know what people call free mixing <laughs> this uh this term um i mean you you've been quite vocal about this now this coming from um or this in places like let's say pakistan or india these topics are pure taboo yeah hmm. even though people do these things but when like if if you ask uh, even a person who is dating doing all the haram things but when you ask him is it is it halal he says astaghfirullah it's not halal it's haram and if you if you tell them no it's not like that even though he's doing that but he's yeah. going to get you know uh, people even the uh, people who are apparently considered as uh, moderate or um, uh, like modern people they get uh, they may they may even kill you and recently <laughs> uh, in the last two weeks a uh, bank manager told his security guard to when you are going on a break just pray the uh, first and and do not pray so much just first is enough so the guard security guard killed that manager oh yeah i heard about even this even though this was and, a recent and, and the security guard he, he, he himself does not have a beard right like you are not keeping a beard god is sunna mm. optional mm. but you are killing a bank manager for telling you to only pray first namaz and come back right 
So, and then we got yesterday to um, Christians killed in Pakistan. Who? A Christian couple. In Christian, I, Christian couple killed in Pakistan. I don't, I don't know about uh, this. What, what couple, was? yeah. Uh, uh, or the, the guy, uh, I, I, I forgot the name of the guy. Mm-hmm. He accused them of blasphemy and killed both of them ah. on the spot. Um, and like, and like, people made people made video about that. Like, so if you're living in a society like Pakistan or India, where we, when you have Hindu and Muslim extremists who may even uh, who may kill you, you know, for no reason. One of my friend from India was telling me like they don't even eat chicken in the public because if any you know pe- people from RSS they may find out they may accuse you of eating beef and lynch you in public yeah. or eating like, so. Um, and we have the in Pakistan as well people like that yeah. who may accuse you of blasphemy anytime. Yeah. So I mean that's goddamn crazy, man. I mean, how has for things to mess up that bad that this Gustahi thing just beca- has become a, a like a you know it's just a free license that if you hate someone <laughs> say yeah this guy's a Gustahi and. Uh, uh, he's blasphemed against the prophet <laughs> and just just kill him and people will hail you as a hero they'll be like wow the imam imam waki ibn al jarrah he was narrating the hadith of the pro- uh, was narrating one of the hadith and people accused him of blasphemy and the sultan and the scholar of his time uh, gave fatwa to execute him seriously so, about waki yeah damn okay yeah imam waki ibn al jarrah wow. and um, and then imam sufyan ibn uyana he inter- intervened and saved him so he was about to get killed for narrating the hadith right he was one of the imams of al sunnah and respected in both the circles of ahlul rai and ahlul hadith so he was when he was accused of blasphemy he was accused of um, he, he, the mufti of his time gave fatwa to kill him now you can imagine from that time to then how people are you know nurtured over yeah. this thing they have been um, so this is their mentality mm, damn that is just crazy i mean it's weird how religion works people up like that you know the the maliki scholar qadi abu bakr ibn arabi in his commentary on tirmidhi he he you see he writes in uh, his journal so those of you that don't know uh, uh, Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, not the Sufi ibn Mahyaddin ibn Arabi, but the Maliki uh, scholar Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi. What he often does is in between he, his commentary on Tirmidhi, he will include journals. Like he'll say, oh, you know, on this day I was passing by this town and this happened. And, uh, and it's so fascinating now because it gives you a window into their world. So you'll read about things and you think, wow, OK, is that how um, um, like an interesting thing, just to give you an example, is he speaks about when he was in Damascus, he was invited to some aristocrats house and it was they, they had like a huge house. And what they had was a small water stream inside the main room and they had a kitchen, obviously, behind it was a separate room and they had these curtains. And what they would do is place trays with whatever the food is on the stream of water and it would kind of come through where they're sitting and they would eat it and when they finished with it they would put the utensils back in the stream and it would slide through and it's amazing just hearing you know reading about that now in 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 our time but anyway he mentions that he was going through um modern day palestine quds and places like that he was traveling and he's with his teacher, Bakr Tartushi, who's very harsh against Bida. Um, and he has a book called Al Hawadith Wal Bida, uh, condemning it. So they stop to pray in this prayer uh, facility that's set up. And his teacher, Bakr Tartushi, does rough al whilst he's praying. And the people are so horrified. <laughs> <laughs> with Rafal Yadain, that they actually say that Qumu ilayhi, like he actually quotes them saying, the, the sheikh says, you know, he, he rallies his little crowd, he says, grab him, and they, 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 they kind of prayer facilities is close to this cliff, like a small uh, 
um, like a mountainside. And they say that throw him off the cliff. And he explains Abu Bakr ibn Arabi how he he just about like convinces them that please let him go. Like he this is another um, you know, this is another opinion from Imam Malik. You can do Rafal Yadain in Salah and please this is a and he explains all these things and they yes. just about let him <laughs> and these are and these are religious people. It's not <laughs> So I don't know what happens that, you see, fanaticism, when it's shrouded in religion, it just becomes so ugly. It has a, a an unbelievably, uh, you know, shocking face to it. That's, that's uh, the gist of what I wanted to say. We had a... Um... Just to add, we had an imam uh, from um, Uganda. He was uh, a Muslim convert. He came to Pakistan and studied in the Jami Abi Bakar. He also studied in, I think, Medina University. So he had, like, uh, he was an African, but he studied with the Pakistan and studied in Pakistan and spent so many years. So he he was very well mannered in Urdu, you know. So he used to give uh, lectures in local Salafi mosques. And he was a scholar. So once he expressed his opinion about faith field and Fatih Akhal Fulima, and, um, and he sided with Albani's opinion that you can um, remain silent when the Imam is reciting. You can just listen him and you don't have to recite the Fatiha. And the faith field is not obligatory. The faith fail. Yeah. So, yeah, faith field is not. Uh, but but the, the Pakistani selfies just kicked him out instantly out of the mosque and banned him from ever um, coming back to that mosque uh, or, you know, giving lectures. So, and he just left, cried, like he was uh, weeping and he left the mosque. That happened like in front of me. So um, what I'm saying is, um, pe you know, people have been nurtured on this thing. Like yeah. they, ha they, have meant they have made this mentality so common that even if you're telling or nurturing them as build, uh, uh, a very genuine issue, uh, which is related with the, their day-to-day -day life. And like now you were talk, uh, talking about that porno or discussing pornography is uh, has become controversial. It's not become I controversial. I think it's, that's everyone always been controversial. The, <laughs> ev everyone discusses the pornography, but the problem is they only tell mm. what they like to tell. But if you differ with them, you know, one of the guys, he when I discussed on anal sex and, um, and posted that the scholars have declared all these narrations as are weak, mm -hmm. including Imam Bukhari, Nasai, and all the big scholars. Which, which narrations on so, anal sex? The prohibition of anal the sex, yeah, In Abu Dawood. All weak books, people, yeah. so, all weak. So he, <laughs> that, that guy, uh, that guy accused me of saying, uh, see, uh, he, he was uh, also studied in Medina, and he said to me, see, this guy is uh, taking the name uh, anal sex. And then he's quoting the hadith, the same hadith, which contains these wordings of anal sex. He's quoting against me and saying this, this guy is, is spreading indecency and immorality and, um, you know, and... Um, it's interesting like that. Yeah. why that's uh, an immorality. It's uh, That's interesting that he, it's seen as a... <laughs> he's accusing me of immorality for you know, take um, like for calling it anal sex, but he's quoting the same hadith, which contains the same wordings against me. I mean, that's a contradiction. You are telling me that I'm spreading indecency by calling it anal sex. Well, what what, you what should you call it? Are... What's he trying to say? What should you call it? Yeah, I mean... He's just saying that. Why are can... you using this word? Making it yeah, public? Yeah, why I'm using this word. Yeah, oh, why right. I'm using okay. this word. So he, but then he quoted the same narrations and fatawas, which contains the same, same wording. <laughs> so he just contradicted himself. I don't know where, like, instead of answering me that these narrations are sahih, mm. like you can quote the scholars and people can read it. But he, look at their mentality. When they don't have anything to say, they come up with these stupid excuses. Mm. And they discuss it themselves as well. They also tell that, you ask them, is anal sex halal? They said, no, it's haram. But when you say, no, the narrations are weak. Let's say okay. so they will accuse you, and they will attack. They will do personal attacks. You know. But so, tell me, in their own circles, do you think they consider it halal? 
I think they do do it practically in the madrasa, <laughs> but um... <laughs> he goes. Al al an ikhtasaltu minhu. You know, you know the narration See, that I've just no, done ghusl from I'm, it right now. No, this is a, <laughs> uh, other than uh, jokingly, this is a very uh, genuine issue. See, if you go to the universities and colleges of which we are going to discuss the free mixing issue, uh, but in madrasa. See the the mother mother of science religious people they propagate that uh, this is haram indecency is haram these morality manners and adab they speak about these things but the university does not say we are teaching morals over here we are doing like they are duniyavi people they do whatever they like but the mother of science people mm-hmm. they are not only engaging in zina but they are enforcing and raping child the maulvis. they are this is a very i've discussed with so many uh, students from madrasa and scholars and they they when they discuss with me they tell c kashif they are two different things people consensually having sex in universities or colleges although the ratio is very low of course but because when what we call zina it's a different thing than mere kissing and you know yeah. smooching and things like that so the the guy the, the those students and scholars said to me see kashif um uh, when you are a a, a a a child is coming to you children coming to you to study quran or they are coming to your madrasa you are not having you are having sex with them against their will you are raping them these people are uh, these people they are raping them so this is more bigger than just zina this is of course, rape of course of course It's this is there, an and, abomination see, mm-hmm. so there is a difference so although we are joking but it is real and they are <clears throat> they indulge in these things and this is one of the scholars from yemen he said if you ban the free mixing of schools in in, in a school college and universities the people are going to engage in homosexuality because especially the male they are more urge to to our sexual desire mm-hmm. right so uh, even though female uh, less uh, as compared to males mm-hmm. they do they, they also engage in these things in the uh, in the homosexuality but as compared to uh, uh, males they are less likely to do that but the males if you leave them uh, just with their gender they definitely going to engage within themselves and that's what happened in madrasa because they don't get the female right this thing is inevitable no of course of course if you what it does is that you see extreme segregation breeds perversion that's the general rule yeah. that you segregate something yeah. it will become perverted um and that is for, and that's what you see in any kind of institution that practices that yeah. um Yeah, I mean that it is very unfortunate. I mean, may Allah make things easy for anybody. And they try to hide these things. Oh yeah, of course. Because they say it's, defam- it's defaming the religious institutes. Like, are see religious institutes are built of like they are, they are not human beings. Religious institutes are just made of you know the wall and uh, roof. But the the actual human beings, they matters most. of their like how they go through the trauma whole the whole of their lives and how they suffer and when you raise someone he becomes a rapist as well because when he grows up he goes to treat uh, quran someone he does the same thing because he uh, you know he he gets abused mm. so he does the same thing you do, well. statistics do show although it's not always the case but it, they do show like your sanction that the victim turned um you know op- oppressor or victim turned abuser cycle is uh, it's it's reasonably common in abusers yeah so uh, they, 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 they pick up these things from the teachers because teacher uh, these uh, people in madrasa they beat them with you know uh, stick yeah, yeah. and uh, what they call it um, the tree stick which branch, is you know foldable and branch. yeah 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 so uh, they beat with that and it leaves marks so when they become teachers they do the same thing with their students they beat the hell yeah. out of them so because it's normalized so yeah like they they become yes yeah, you know when i was uh, doing my hifth in islamabad um 
Now, because I went there as a mature student, like I would have been uh, at least, you know, probably I think I was 19. So whereas people doing Hifth are sometimes, I mean, there were some people who were also 19, but they'd been there for so many years. They weren't starting uh, at that age. So uh, I, I remember that the Ustad this one day, <laughs> it's not a laughing issue. But what what he did was he 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 beat the hell out of the out of the kids. I mean he he got the stick, the branch, like you're saying, and he was battering them. I mean he was literally beating the hell out of them. And so what happens is he notices because I'm quite new, and I had uh, prior to that I had been in Damascus, so he noted that the look of shock on my face because it's not that I haven't seen, you know, like when we were kids in the UK, we used to go to the masjid. They used to beat up kids here, but that was like in the late eighties. So laws were, you know, not quite, hadn't caught up then, but you see, it's not that I hadn't seen it, but now years later, you're seeing it in front of you. They're just bad. They're going wild. So he, he can see that I'm kind of shocked. <laughs> what the hell? All these kids crying their heads off. And and then what happens is he, uh, when when class was dismissed, he calls me. <laughs> and he goes, uh, he goes like, you know, in Damascus, did they used to also uh, beat up the kids like this? So So I said, Nah, 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 they don't. They didn't. Not like this. I mean, they didn't. I mean, Damascus wasn't like that at all. So he goes, "Ah, uh, okay." Then he goes, uh, "He goes, yeah, there are some Pakistani awam here. You know, it's uh, this is the Pakistani public. They don't listen. Even parents tell them to beat. Yeah, them. exactly. Even parents tell that, uh, that they to, say yeah. that. Look, if you don't beat them, they're not going to listen. So you need to." beat them black and blue like you need to like they said the meat the meat is ours and the bones are yours <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh fun and games people huh madrasa lifestyle and you know the the other sexual abuse thing the shocking thing is i have mentioned this before in my shows that in those madrasas they don't like, even though they don't publicly condone that, they don't say that that's acceptable, but they yeah. seem to not be that fussed. Like, they don't, you know, they like, they're not saying, oh, you can go around sexually abusing, but they, like, when they hear about cases, they're not that moved to do something about it. Whereas if they heard that you were listening to music in your room or you were... Uh, watching something in your room, like you had, or you were watching a movie, or you trimmed your beard. They, you know, yeah. they would turn like all hell, <laughs> all hell would be let loose yeah. uh, uh, in in hunting you down. So it's interesting their priorities. Of course, yeah. When I was young, um, even my um, you're, you're still young, uh, chef. We had, a, ah, be no yeah, we, we, <laughs> we had we had a teacher. He used to come and teach us Quran in our house. Me and my younger brother. So once uh, my dad he saw he saw the teacher. He put a pencil in my finger and he was twisting it to punish. Me. Oh yeah, yeah. They used so to do he, that. They would yeah. kind of do these so kung fu techniques. Saw, <laughs> yeah, my my father saw it and he uh, called called on that Malvi and he just said don't come from tomorrow mm. he just uh, kicked him out and um, but my other relatives and they said uh, uh, this is just a normal thing and they made like they made fun of it he said it's, it's normal like uh, our uh, yeah our children uh, <laughs> get beaten daily and, and the what they do is they the put it is, down sometimes and then crush it <laughs> proper kung fu training going on <laughs> you know, for God's sake, you've just come to recite the Quran, and it's like the, the, the guy's training you like this. It put, put pencil, put your hand down, and wah! 
<laughs> yeah. If someone is going if someone is going to do with my kid, I'm going to break his arm of bone first and then I'm going to talk him next because I'm not going to tolerate this shit mm. with my children no, true. at Obviously, all. Obviously. And I can't even see it with with other children like their children why why you're beating them. So that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So wow. Subhanallah. Right. So this Sheikh, we were speaking about these topics, things like um, uh, what what you'd written about recently, this shared space between the genders, what people often call free mixing. And this is often a question asked by the religious crowd that look, oh my God, can men and women be, um, you know, can they be in the same space together? Can they be unsupervised? Oh my God, a man and a woman in the same room. Toba, toba, toba. <laughs> so, Ispar Aap, uh, if you can, Ispar Roshni, Roshni Dal, if you can shed a lamp, a, a floodlight on this topic for us, please. Uh, see, a lot of things, mm -hmm. um, if you see that, after the demise of the Prophet uh, and if you compare what he did in his life and what the Fuqaha did, I'm not accusing Fuqaha, but they did according to the Ishtihad, right? At the time of the Prophet, you wouldn't see any punishment for abandoning the prayer, right? You wouldn't like um, any punishment for leaving the prayer. And uh, it was possible for the prophet to um, to stay any punishment, right? Yeah. But what happened? After, but if you look at the fukaha, they say if you leave the prayer, imprison them, uh, give them punishment, uh, issue tazir punishments, or um, some are of the view that they have become apostates, just kill them. According to Sheikh Ibn Baz, he issued a fatwa: if you wake up early in the morning yeah. for going to office. But if you're going to office, but if you're not praying Fajr, you have become Kafir. I have been buzzed. So, um, what I'm saying is that you find these types of fatawa. I respect, see, we respect the scholars, but we don't, we disagree with these fatwas, right? Of course. Respecting a person, disagreeing, but the, then people will say you, you are not even close to the dust of these scholars and this and that. Come up with several ex excuses. So, the top, this topic of free mixing, um, at the time of the Prophet, yeah. the women, they used to pray in day and night with the men. The Prophet did not even separate like their timings or, or provided a, you know, a confined a place for them, like we have in massages today, which allow the, uh, for, which allows the women to pray in the mosque. Most don't, but some some Salafi mosques and some yeah. uh, Western mosques they allow them. But even they have made different underground uh, in, in the basement area or in the top floors or confined separate rooms for mm. them, secluded from the men. But if you look at the time of the Prophet, their rows were different. The rows were different, prayer rows, but they still prayed in the same row. And one more thing, then the people come up with the excuse, if you're going to let them pray, like at the time of the Prophet, then they will, you know, um, they will get uh, get uh, attraction and get, uh, you know, instead of praying, they will get attracted to women and will start talking with them. and will <laughs> As opposed so to being gay. Even, see, <laughs> yeah, see, even now, to, uh, in, at the time of the Prophet, there used to be some beautiful uh, beautiful women and the Sahabas, even during the prayer, when they would go in Ruku, they would see their faces from their under, from their armpits. During the as prayer. As in, you're trying to say, it's like... It's the Sunan al-Tirmidhi. It's a Sahih. They'd try and look at them, as in, look at uh, just... Okay. Yeah, while, while mm. praying. Yeah, while praying, they were tried when they would go in Ruku because the women, they used to pray in the in the back row. Yeah. So they used to, when they would go in Ruku, they would try to see from under their armpits the faces of those beautiful this women. Is, this is in Tarmidhi. And, uh, 
Boston. Yeah, yeah. It's the Sahih Hadith. Allama Al-Bani has declared it Sahih. Another scholar. Ah, 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 ah. So, and he, Allama Al-Bani has discussed this, uh, discussed this notion thoroughly. Ah. About its um, authenticity. Wow. So, um, what happened then? Uh, so, the Prophet did not even say their, that their prayer has become invalid. The Prophet did not even say that their prayer has become invalid, let alone putting a ban on women or men or separating them from praying together. Because this is natural, right? So, um, women used to go at the time of the, a woman was raped when going to the Fajr. Yeah, you know, we did, on yeah, this, I think we did discuss and I did, I, I think it was more, was it not harassed? Uh, no, that um, it was about um, I think ra- raping her because in the uh, in the uh, in the book of Had, and I think that's what the uh, mentioned under the commentaries. And I think some scholars did, did say that the prophet uh, forgave the Had on that person because uh, he confessed and uh, admitted and made repentance. But others argued that that specific part of uh, forgiving him is shas. But other than that, the whole narration is sahih. So anyways, mm-hmm. uh, even he harassed, let for sake of argument, we accept that he harassed mm-hmm. her or did, um, because, it, or uh, raped her. So what happened was the prophet did not blame the victim. And he did not say to the woman to not to go uh, mock in the dark time, in, early in the mm-hmm. dark. And also, on the contrary, the Prophet said that do not prevent women from going to the mosque even at night. Do not prevent them from going to the mosque even at night time. Mm-hmm. So, this free, and when they say the free mixing is haram, if you ask them, why is that haram? Like, wh- what's, the, what's the evidence from the, from the Quran and so on that it's haram? They'll come up that the, at the time of the Prophet, the roles of the man and woman used to be uh, separate. I mean, the, the woman would pray behind the man. Yeah. Right? So, they, are, they don't even understand this. The man and woman, they are praying together, but in different roles. And even scholars of uh, the, the, scholar, the jurists, the Fuqaha and Muhaddasin, like Imam Nabawi and others, they have said, even if man and woman pray in the same row, like they're standing in the same row, their prayers are valid. Of course, yeah. The prayers are valid, but what is preferable that the woman would pray in, in the back rows and men would pray in the front rows. So they don't understand the fit of the narrations. They just, uh, you know, they do literal reading and I don't know how they conclude that it has become haram for them. Now then they, they come with other another um, interpretation that it is haram for women to leave the house. To leave the house, yeah. It lockdown, for them permanent lockdown. To leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they they uh, do and they do took evidence from the Quran that wakarna fi buyuti kunna that to remain in your houses. Now the problem is that um, Ibn Jarir al Tabari. That's the problem. Yeah, the problem is Ibn Jarir al Tabari. Uh, he's one of the major <laughs> mufassir. Ibn Jarir al Tabari. He he said in his tafsir the recitation of Kuf and Batra with the Kasra on Kaf. Yeah. It becomes, then the, it changes the meaning. It becomes that be dignified in your houses. Be from the people of tranquility. Tranquility, in, yeah. Be from the people mm. in your houses. It does not, it does not, it, it does not mean that to remain in your houses. And Ibn Jarir Tabri then says, the recitation of Kufa and Basra is more correct to me. Mm. Right? So, and one of the early hadith scholars, a few of them, I can name them, like Mufti Mubashir Ahmad Rabbani and others, they are one of the prominent figures in Pakistan. They also adopt this meaning. They said it's not um, haram for them to leave without no reason. I mean, they, they, these, these people argue that the woman can leave house only when it, there's a necessity. But scholars, like even the very traditionalist scholars, like Sheikh Rashad al I asked, I mm-hmm. asked him a few years back that is it is it allowed for a woman to go and do job volunt- voluntarily? Like if she does not, mm-hmm. if she does not need to do job, but she wants to do a job, if she can go out of her house without any need, he said yes. Of course. He said yes. He said many of our 
he said many of our even there were some teachers of mian azir husain dehli were female teachers ahle hadith teachers and uh, even at the time of salaf there used to be female teachers allama albani's daughter she teaches hadith to the men right so so um, they they if you are even if you are doing it voluntarily going out of house it is not only allowed when it is necessary you can go of out of course of course so this is and uh, you know this uh, waqarna you know, fi biyutik kunna so would cuz even the verb waqara if you're looking at this just the general understanding going with uh, how it is well you know waqarna fi biyutik fi biyutik kunna the verse is speaking about being established like when something is being settled within your homes like waqara usually means yeah. to settle so the common uh statement that for example yeah. people use when they say things like oh iman faith is that ma they will say you know yeah. waqara fil qalb it settled in the heart so when you're telling a couple or even if you're telling women or you're telling uh men that look be settled in your homes that that by no mean uh by no stretch translates to saying become you know you're in lockdown <laughs> what it means is to take care of your homes as in your family's prioritize your familial lifestyle that's that's what it's clearly talking about but and even from the uh, the, the lifestyle of the arabs at that time they never had a custom of women not going out women did used to go out all the time i mean they were not kind of like this very shy timid uh participants in society even even those scholars who take the and with the fatha on kaf wa karna fi biyuti kunna they like ibn hajar al kalani al muhallab sheikh salih al uthaymin and various other scholars they they even say that this was does not imply obligation for women to re- stay in their houses they say if, uh, uh, and they uh, take evidences from so many different uh, narrations that the women used to go out of their houses without any need of course they used to um, even after the demise after the demise of the prophet uh, at the time of uthman uh and umar uh the wives of the prophet they want they wanted to do hajj or umrah and uh because they they did not have uh, they did not have any mahram who could take them to hajj or umrah so they were uh they had a ban on them to go out uh you know, because they couldn't do hajj or umrah without the permission of uh without mahram but later on the sahaba had consensus this is what ibn hajar asqalani said to go out without any mahram mm-hmm. they did at the time of umar and usman and it continued afterwards like mm-hmm. that so this is also an evidence that the sahaba had consensus that the women could go can go out without of mahram course, of course i mean on their own. and you know al baji the maliki scholar writes in his commentary on the muatta which is muntaqa he says that look he even says about traveling on their own and this is almost a thousand years ago he says that as long as a woman is traveling in uh, and this is going 1000 years back people right so he says if a woman is traveling in a caravan yeah. uh then that's like going to town he says uh wa hiya kal qarya or like yeah. going to uh he says it is she she can travel on her own that the main thing is safety that they were just worried about safety so he does highlight that it's just this mindset you know you you had this quote from some of the salaf which i found quite hilarious it said that uh, the uh, yeah. people in the time of the salaf used he is from the salaf he's saying that the men and the women used to share a uh, a majlis wa amma al yawm fa in al isba' min asabi' al mar'a taftin you know now it seems that even a single finger seeing a finger of a woman appears to be so much fitna uh <laughs> i found that quite hilarious uh that that's attributed to uh do you, do you recall which uh tabi'i that was attributed to al matar al warraq okay matar al warraq okay so what is where does that 
creep in because you've got in the Muatta of Imam Malik the hadith that men and women in the lifetime of the Prophet yeah. used to do wudu together. It says jami'an that they together would from yeah. the same vessels yeah. do wudu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, see, not, yeah. Yep. Sorry. Carry on. No, you, 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 you were saying about that. See, if we look in the, in the hadith literature, you will find various hundreds of incidents of the, the, the Sahaba and Sahabiyat interacting with each other, going out with each other, talking with each other, having dinner together, having lunch together. And even uh, uh, now we have a common perception that, that if, you, if the Muslims want to go to a doctor, you would only see the doctor from the same sex. But at the time of the Salaf, they, if, if there happens to be a doctor uh, from the different, from the opposite gender, a mm -hmm. this allowed them to look at their private parts and to treat, treat them. So th that they, they were so uh, open-minded and they allowed, they didn't consider these things against, against the Sharia as compared to not, what the common Muslims have uh, understood that uh, you cannot go to uh, go, go and see a doctor of opposite gender. Mm -hmm. You cannot interact with them. And uh, they have made this like if you're talking with someone, it has haram. It is haram to talk with someone. Uh, and like they have gone to another extreme. Yeah. You know, you mentioned that they used to meet each other from the opposite gender. They may even have food or they, or they would interact. What are some examples of this? Because people yeah. would say, Sheikh, what is your dalil? Dalil, hatu burhanakum in kuntum So what is this, what is the dalil that you have? That this used to happen? Uh, we have several incidents. Like if we, um, I was trying to, um, I was just, I had written so many articles on that. I, uh, if you look at the uh, Sahib Bukhari, Imam Bukhari have made a chapter of men and women talking with each other, mm -hmm. greeting each other. The, and Ibn Hajar Skalani and other commentators, and he has brought those narrations where stranger men and women are interacting with, with each other. Mm -hmm. So the commentators, they have said, this hadith indicates that it is permissible for stranger men to talk, to talk with each other. Mm -hmm. Right? And uh, uh, I, I narrate you another uh, hadith was... Uh, uh, with uh, um, the companion Salban, he visited to the house of Abu Darda and he met her, uh, his wife, uh, Umm Darda. Yeah. Um, uh, and what happened that um, uh, Umm Darda, she complained to a stranger man who, is a, who was a non-maharam to her about her sexual life, that her husband is not interested in the luxury of this world. It's not interested in having sex with her. Okay, so she's explaining this to so the other who's not related to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, he's explaining something of her private life to a stranger man, to a, an, a friend, uh, to the friend of his husband. Yeah. So uh, then Salman went to Abu Darda and he uh, did counseling to him that uh, you have a private life as well. You do a lot of fasting and you have to have, you know, fulfill the mm -hmm. sexual desires of the woman as well. And Ibn Hajjaz Kalani in his uh, uh, commentary, he said that uh, like the, the, a woman, he's, she's, uh, if, if, there's, uh, if she wants to discuss these things, she can discuss. Like this was the open-mindedness. She's discussing about her private life to a stranger man who is not a mahram to her. Mm -hmm. So th these were the level of talk they used to had, right? And there's another hadith that uh, at the time of the Prophet, two Sahaba, uh, one or two, uh, I think, uh, Sahabi entered in the house of Abu Bakr mm -hmm. when her wife was alone. With Abu Bakr's uh, wife. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. 
so her when her wife was alone when abu bakr came to know this and uh, he complained it to the prophet so the he said then uh, the prophet called on everyone and he said to the people who visited her house and to abu bakr abu bakr said that i don't uh, uh, like i don't uh, I, i believe in my wife and everything but i don't like it if someone visits my wife uh, uh, on and and my back at my back or behind me yeah as in i'm not so the there and they said, yeah see the word yeah if you enter someone's house now see the ruling of the prophet he said if you enter someone's house then you should be more than one male if you are entering at a stranger woman house then you should be more than one male not only single like you should not do seclusion like one male and one female mm-hmm. but you should accompany another male another stranger man mm-hmm. but that makes that separates the khalwa the seclusion now this is uh, uh, the prophet is not prohibiting that man who is uh, who is uh, uh, naam haram to uh, her wife mm-hmm. to enter uh, to enter the wife of abu bakar behind her back but he what he is saying is do not go alone so as to prevent suspicion because uh, someone else yeah. was... and that's in sahih muslim isn't yeah, it? that that narration is in sahih muslim i believe yeah mm. right yeah that's in sahih muslim mm-hmm. yeah. and and this uh, this this another one because i know some of the people had asked about you mentioned about eating food and things i think uh, there's another narration by shabi which is also in sahih muslim isn't it about visiting uh, yeah. uh fatima bin qais yeah. yeah and and they dis- there discussing are narrations with her. where the sahaba where there are also narrations in bukhari and muslim where the sahaba gave lift uh, to the female companions on behind their back on the camels yeah like now the no no like at at that time you know when you're sitting on a camel and someone is sitting behind you it would move and you get to shake with each like you get to shake with each like you know that your body moves <laughs> yeah. things like no i'm i'm no, serious you are. <laughs> this is different when you're sitting when you're sitting in a car now the contemporary scholar yeah one of the selfie scholars he was asked is it permissible for women to travel alone in a taxi if she's going to um, like if she's going somewhere if she can travel in a taxi not out of the city within the city mm-hmm. so he said it is haram for her to go to travel in a taxi alone you never know where the taxi driver may take you right so uh, <laughs> this is the, the level of absurdity mm-hmm. and uh, um, uh, so what happened that um, what i'm saying is now compare this scenario with motorcycle and bike now no we are no we are not talking about cars where a woman can where a stranger woman can sit behind uh, at, at the back seat but if you uh, like if you ask any scholar is it permissible uh, for a woman uh, for a stranger man to give lift to a uh, to a stranger female he would uh, he would say straight away it is haram mm. right but back then they are traveling on the same camel yeah with a stranger you know who who are opposite gender and stranger to each other and it's in bukhari and muslim it's not in um, uh, in any other books yeah so, and this the f- and there are several incidents and like this the famous narration of subaya isn't there in uh, sahil bukhari when um yeah uh, who is it that comes to visit her somebody comes to visit her and 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 he says to her that well you know oh you seem to be all done up with uh, uh it's Oh, right let me is it uh it's abu sanabil isn't it abu sanabil who comes to visit her and he says that you know you seem to be all yeah. kind of done up as in you're looking to get married and she ain't you meant to be in an idda um and she says yeah but i was yeah. my idda has already yeah. finished because i gave birth and they have this debate and they end up going to the prophet and the prophet says she's right and then he marries her abu sanabil is the one who marries um subaya and and just in case people think well they they yeah. were alone in her house 
uh, people might say, oh, they were relatives. But they weren't relatives because he's the one who marries her. Yeah, they were no mm. relatives. And that's in Bukhari. That's in, it's a very famous... Uh... Uh, the I have, I'm looking at a narration and uh, I posted in one of my articles where I discussed uh, shaking hands between ma- male and female. Okay. There was hadith in Bukhari, I think, or is, was it in Muslim? But I, I'm sure it was in Bukhari. Uh, so um, I think it was Abu Musa al-Ashari. Okay. He used to go to a stranger female to her house and she used to take out uh, lices from his head. Yeah, she yeah, lices, out, like uh, these kind of head lice. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. She would take out, uh, you know that... Um, what do you guys call it? Head lice. Yeah, head lice. Yeah. Can you hear me? Head lice. Yeah. Mm. So she was, a, she was a stranger, a Nam Harem to Abu Musa al Ashari. Mm-hmm. And she used to touch her head, uh, touch his head, and would take out lessons from, uh, from his head. Mm-hmm. Now she's touching his head and taking out, uh, like providing kind of a service to him. So she was a stranger uh, woman uh, uh, to him, and he would go out, go to uh, visit her house alone. Mm. So there are many incidents like that. And see, the concept of ikhtilat. Now they say that ikhtilat is forbidden. Now I'm talking from fixed perspective. If you look at the books of mutakaddimin scholars, the mutakaddimin fuqaha, the early yeah. jurists, you wouldn't find any chapter. Or a section for ikhtilaf. Yeah. In fact, you this whole any this, this whole it's, word you put shir, find... ikhtilat, which yeah. is the the Arabic common word, the the standard word, sorry, modern standard word for what people call shared space or free mixing. Uh, ikhtilat means to mix. Now, even though this word is classical Arabic. But this usage is very modern. And this term to say ikhtilat, referring to mixed uh, space between the genders, is a very modern phenomenon. So you wouldn't get this in any of the classical fic books generally. Now, they have used this word as a one-off, but not generally as a concept. Yeah, of course. If I think, as far as I remember, uh, it was in the hadith of uh, Hajj of Tawaf, the word khalat or khalat. But look at that. If you look in the hadith, so, it is talking about the permissibility of khalat, of the free mixing, because they do Hajj and Umrah. Tawaf so the word together. does. They are it, not different like, timings. Like I, I, I say that. The, no, I was yes. going to say that the word the like Allah wa ta'ala, he knew that people the word like be... mukhalata, which is from this yeah. root, does appear in. I'm not saying that the word is not a new word, as in this root and the Arabic usage of the word ikhtalata yeah. for something to mix yeah. is yeah. not new. However, today, the way in English there is this, and this is a wrong word because in English. You don't really say free mixing, but people, Muslims tend to use the word free mixing to mean kind of like mingling, intermingling of the two of the genders. So the way this word free mixing is being used modernly, this is a new usage. Uh, the word ikhtilat to refer to shared space or this intermingling is a modern phenomenon. Um, you won't you won't you don't find it generally throughout the classical works of Islam, even though obviously this issue was, it existed, you know, this issue of should people mix or not, it did exist. Just as the word hijab is is a new modern phenomenon for what was traditionally the khimar. So today, for maybe the last hundred years or yeah. so, they refer to it as a hijab. So yeah. Yeah, but but you were saying yeah, sorry about the ikhtilat and about even hajj. if you look yeah, because when they say that khalwa is haram, 
they contradict themselves by saying ikhtilat is also haram. Because halwa and ikhtilat, they are both opposite things. Yeah. So, somebody, sorry, somebody just of, said, uh, 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 sorry, Sheikh, somebody just said they didn't use the term Tajweed either, but they did use the word Tajweed traditionally. So I'm not talking about just the Prophet and the Sahaba. I'm talking about they never used this word Ikhtilat to refer to the phenomenon up until only like 100 years ago or less than that. Whereas this issue of intermingling if you want to call it between the genders is has been going on ever since whereas the word tajweed has been used for over a thousand years since the science has come into existence so the moment fiqh came into existence as a discipline they gave it a name the moment naho came in they gave it a name the moment tajweed came in they gave it a name but this issue has been there but this usage of this word is very modern so there is a disagreement with that yeah uh, sorry ca ca carry on see if the if the like see we are not uh, we are not uh, playing uh, games around the word course, itself uh, now uh, let me answer also answer this uh, if you say uh, that uh, the word istilat wasn't there but so so okay which word was the fuqaha used for this uh, for this thing uh, tell us uh, from the Muttakaddameen Fukaha what word they used for free mixing, for intermingling of sexes, because the intermingling of sexes has been, they, has been there since exactly. day one. The intermingling of sexes has been there since day one. So what word they used? If they haven't used, they used, there needs to be a, a, a Fiki Istala uh, uh, for, uh, for this issue. So the reason why we are discussing Ikhtilat because the, the, uh, the Mutakhiri in Fukaha and the people in, t in t today's time, they refer to this scenario as ikhtilat. So all I'm arguing is where where does where did the early fuqaha they mentioned this issue of um, ikhtilat is haram, it's totally forbidden. See, we are not saying that uh, if you are going to a disco club, like if you are going to like people, the places which are which leads to indecency or um, like which the places. Uh, which uh, you know le leads to seduction, temptation. We are talking about restaurants, hospitals, offices, schools, in in general life. We are talking about and the, the common in, things. The reason is uh, like when you go some to, people go out to are asking. Some people yeah. may be wondering, well, what what you know, what's the big deal if they never had a word? It is important because before you can discuss something, a phenomenon has to be coined. Like you, you see, when you give something a name it becomes a phenomenological entity to discuss. So uh, the whole discussion on it changes. And if something has already existed, it's not like uh, it's always like this issue of, let's say, a modesty and men and women yeah. having sex with each other, you know, outside of a nikah is not a new issue. So to say that the scholars only came up with the word for it in our modern times is is ridiculous because the, because this issue has always existed so what were they calling it then now the issue is they weren't obviously calling it anything because they weren't addressing it like this we have in modern times become hypersensitive about drawing boundaries and saying men and women you know uh, you, you're not allowed to mix whereas if you take the Haram, Mecca, or if you take the marketplaces, they've always been uh, mixed, whether it's been the masjid or whether it's been the, the marketplace. So that's my point for those who are wondering. But yeah, sorry, Sheikh, you were saying. See, not only the Estelat, if you look at the attitude of scholars, they have written books on the prohibition of women to write and study. They have written books. <laughs> that it is just, haram just look for at women the irony write. of that, though, Sheikh. To write a book saying it is haram for women to because, write, <laughs> to read and write. Because they say this, this leads to indecency. Mm. 
this leads to independence independency of women and they could write love letters to the men so yaar they what i don't get any of the do you get aapki taraf koi letters aate hain these kind of what is it with the <laughs> my friend used to write for me for in urdu because i was not proficient in writing urdu back then in the school ah <laughs> uh, the shayari sheikh you need to be using the shayari <laughs> but yeah that but this is because i've i've studied at I, i did my last years of school in a ah. boys school so we had a girl um a campus across across our uh, across the street so we used to wave at each other <laughs> because we were we studied uh, our final years of school separate like in wow. separate. look at the the the, the saga people <laughs> like in the in the era of jahiliya We used to be, you know, in the, like, like, we were kids, like, I think 12 or 13 years but, old. But like. these were real fatwas, ain't they? That mm, people had written saying that women should not be allowed to read and write. But then didn't they used to say they could read the Quran? Uh, yeah, but, but uh, uh, there are some scholars that have also say, said that the women are discouraged to reach to a youth <laughs> because this would lead them to read the study uh, to uh, to uh, read the story of uh, Yusuf alayhi salam and this would lead them to provoke desires and indecency amongst them if they read it then they would get temptation like you know and um, about women getting attracted to Yusuf his um, oh, well wow. i've not heard maybe. of this you know to be honest with you so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so if you um uh, i think uh, yeah and and I'd, i'd like to mention that as well uh, shamsul aqadi yeah. mabadi he wrote a book then to refute this uh, uh, opinion that women can read and write wait a minute no as in so he he, what's his opinion they can or they book. can't his is they can. can he refuted the other uh, scholars yeah yeah he uh, he was a traditional scholar but he argued like they uh, that it's it's not haram for them to read because they base their arguments over zealously that this leads to this this mm. like overthinking if they are going there if they are writing this 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 would happen then this they would become independent this would happen they would become rebellious and you know things like that because that time reading and writing was a form of rebellion rebellion Mm. making them independent we are rebellion so um this was uh, back then now things have changed now the rebellion has become to a financial rebellion than the reading and writing okay, so. okay. <laughs> but wow wow so yeah i mean it's it's funny that the when you think about it the face of the deen has so you know that the image of islam has so transformed here you know when you when you think about it from what it originally began with in the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam right down to what the image is often portrayed as today uh about control trying to uh this insecurity especially around the women issues and and the reason i'm highlighting this obviously because you've written about this and it's caused a bit of a stir <laughs> yeah but uh yeah even if you see uh, the see the khalwa the seclusion is not haram in all the cases uh, abu yala al hambali he said that if the man is uh, if, if the man known for his indecency and immorality and he's known for evil that he should not be secluded with the stranger woman but uh imam ahmed bin hanbal he was once asked that if a stranger woman goes and see a doctor that there's a uh, there's an apartment or mm-hmm. a house or a building yeah. in the center of the road and they are secluded in a in a room where no they were they are hidden from the eyes and the people can't hear them so this type of halwa seclusion is it haram right a, a, a male doctor is alone with a female stranger so 
Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal said no. This type of khalwa is not forbidden. So a woman uh, can be with a doctor in a room, right? Where they are hidden from the eyes of the people. People can't hear them. So see, the khalwa is also not forbidden in general. There are exceptions as well. Like there's a difference. Like uh, uh, you know that uh, if you are into a toilet with a female, so definitely this kind of khalwa is haram. But if you're going uh, with if you to are the in, if you are to the in toilet a, in a hospital, if you are yeah, if you're going to toilet with a female, definitely <laughs> like. Um, <laughs> what game? What games are these? Shit? Are how, how does one play these games? <laughs> where where does one have to go? If you're going he, and gonna be the doctor, then that is obvious. <laughs> See, even Imam Bukhari in his Sahih, mm-hmm. he had he made a chapter that a man can be with with woman alone. Uh, that if they are uh, that if they are um, among they are um, present amongst the people, like the people can't see or uh, um, hear them, but they are on the roads, like you know, uh, offices, schools, mm-hmm. and. Clinics, doctor mm-hmm. clinics like that. When you visit a doctor, you often go and sit in their room mm-hmm. alone. So things like that. What yeah. <laughs> It happens. <laughs> Even Imam Nabawi, he made a chapter in his um, on Sahih Muslim, or uh, the commentator uh, or the commentators of uh, Sahih Muslim that it is permissible for a woman about the hadith I was talking earlier. That it is permissible for a woman to ride behind the back of a stranger male if she is exhausted on the road. Wait, to what? To ride? He can ride. Oh, to ride behind the on, okay, on, yeah. journey on, on or... his camel. <laughs> and that's yeah. not a euphemism. <laughs> right. Yeah, on his camel. Or, Would you like uh, or... to ride on my camel? Yeah. कौन से मजाजी इबारात इस्तेमाल किए जा रहे हैं? She's like, wow. An not entire camel. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking about riding on the back, not riding. Which, uh, the back. He's like my dragon. He <laughs> <laughs> can sit. Like he can sit um, on the, and that's what uh, Mohallab in uh, in the commentary uh, also said. The said adopted the similar yeah. sense. That's that's funny because so, in Saudi they're yeah, not allowed to drive cars. Yeah. And uh, I mean, now obviously MBS yeah. has changed it, but they weren't allowed to drive cars because that's all. That's a, yeah, the self scholars, if you listen to them on YouTube, they say that they justify that this urge is sexual desire in women <laughs> if they're is, if they're driving, and if if the if the car uh, you know gets uh, gets uh, um, on the road. It's uh, moving their private parts, and they are urging sexual <laughs> desire. I mean, uh, what? I just, I, mean, I just love the way the Salafi scholars that. think. <laughs> it's like every single thing is just like it's like oh, they, it's the ultimate fantasies. <laughs> <laughs> read and write and oh my god the car gravity and gravity one more, <laughs> mm-hmm. one more thing the these people also quote this hadith that when when the woman goes out out of the house she is a satan she, he's a what she's a satan she's a satan when she, <laughs> where, yeah so this hadith uh, is not uh, proven authentically from the prophet it is weak and and the scholars have the scholars of hadith have we can get hadith as well hmm. uh, don't, don't it's you think it's interesting that it's proven from the prophet it's, it's interesting a, uh, that you see one, yeah. for these particular type of people the woman the woman the archetype uh, that they're fitting all women onto is a this kind of uh, a fantasy woman isn't it she's like this woman that is incredibly uh licentious always everything to do with her is entirely sexual and it's always like like it's 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 this kind of fantasy from their mind that they're projecting onto obviously everyone <laughs> it's like <laughs> the, 
this is the issue they see they see women only as um uh, on the uh, as a as a as a sex uh, as a sexual yeah, and it's not it, and it's see this woman so they are it's not mind... even just the sexual object i meant they're projecting the fantasy onto her so it's like one is that they only see her sexually that is one topic but i'm actually saying they have this image that the woman like and they fit this onto all women then that every woman is this kind of uh you know this kind of hidden prostitute almost <laughs> you know this kind of super uh, uh, you know from the whores of babylon that any moment she gets she will be out there committing zina and she will be you know like anything that triggers her uh, excites her the next like you know this car fatwa that when she sits in a car with the vibrations of the car she's going to get aroused and turned on and it, it, it's like this fantasy image they have <laughs> if you see uh i, I uh, want to watch the movies they're watching the, 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 the taboo in the in our society yeah. if a woman is seen is smoking mm. smoking cigarette she is considered more sinful than a man like if, if cigarette there is, is haram, there is something which, psychologically which more yeah uh, Yeah. There is something psychologically about a woman smoking a cigarette that um is if it is haram yeah. it is as much as haram no, for me no of course like, it, it does not make any difference <laughs> a woman is smoking um, and or a male is smoking if it is haram it is same for both of them or which i i don't agree it is haram it's haram to smoke no, of course i go not. with yeah. the majority of the scholars it's not haram but um even if it's haram yeah. it's say it's haram equally for both of them the sin is equal it's, it does not make any difference you know like in uh places like pakistan uh, generally speaking not I, i don't know if it's changed you probably know better if the culture's changed but like let's say a woman on on a bike if she's a passenger for example uh, or whether she's no she wouldn't be right but if she's a passenger she wouldn't sit generally on the seat would she should sit like sideways without like she, yeah, she wouldn't put like, like legs on both sides of the even even then even then if she's sitting uh the people who are riding behind like other like youngsters or they just when they're driving past by her mm-hmm. they you know uh, uh, what they say um touching her or groping her okay, touching them with damn. hands or okay. telling them mm. giving them their numbers and recently we had a, a scandal in islamabad a bank manager okay someone recorded it her female employee she is standing and he was going back to his seat he just inserted his, her uh, his finger um, in uh, behind her and then the female she didn't say anything because she was shocked like what really happened now the the what happened after that mm. people are divided on this just like in india they are blaming uh, some people they are blaming the woman why she is going out why she is working over there why she is not this 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 is that now see their mentality if a woman is being harassed there may might be several reasons she might be she is doing the job because yeah, you know yeah. there there might be no one to support her she might be alone in her house or she she is just earning a livelihood these idiots these either they sit all their day at home eating haram charities and uh, working st- staying on government doles they are issuing fatwas and saying that why she is leaving her home why she is working why she is not wearing this wearing that the the woman who was what sexually harassed at the time of the prophet she was wearing hijab everything and uh, it was done the prophet did not ban her from going to the mosque right yeah. and he did not uh, uh, pre- prevent them so this is the mentality uh, victim blaming they start blaming the victim yeah. that why she is uh, because they consider these people as only sexual object so why if she is walking by she is spreading indecency if she is walking because because these people they have never interacted with the woman they have studied in the like separately from the woman so uh, even if a woman smiles or talk to them politely they consider it as, as a consent now they can you know they can uh, start they can... laughing ma but that's just so funny <laughs> it just talks yeah. that's consent <laughs> like that acha acha consent done ticket
<laughs> Did you look in my direction? Okay, consent. <laughs> uh, but stuff for lie. I mean, it's it's a horrific. A Excuse my humor, people. A guy in Pakistan divorced his uh, wife because she was sexually active. She was what? She, she was sexually she liked, active. She was sexually active. Yeah, she liked to like to try different positions or to. She's enjoying with, she's his, enjoying with her husband. It. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That filthy. <laughs> wait a minute. That filthy. Her, she was enjoying it. Her toba, husband, toba, toba, toba. Her husband <laughs> is starting doubting her that she is immoral and indecent. Why she is enjoying the sex? <laughs> he goes, "Yar, much se zada maza to tumhe aa raha hai." <laughs> It's like more than me. You seem to be enjoying it. <laughs> What happened was this. Now we, when you do fatawas in uh, of Saudi ulama or Arab or Pakistan Indian ulama, I you get two different kind of curious. One in one instance, the husband is complaining that her wife is not sexually active. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you get that they, quite just, a bit. <laughs> they just laying down. They are just laying down like dead people. <laughs> the, so you can just <laughs> say they are not active. <laughs> down like dead people <laughs> role play talk about <laughs> taking role play to another level <laughs> she's not not interested in doing sex yeah. and things like that so they, because it also happens because in pakistan culture people they don't have any sexual education mm. they don't have anything to know so when they when they come on their first night the husband is ready to because they already have pre planned to do it oh it's mm -hmm. um, so when they engage in halal sex mm. or intercourse The, the so there are two types of complaints, uh, mostly that the wife she she is not aware about anything. She is refusing to do oral sex or she is refusing mm. to and she is even uh, refusing to change positions. She just want to do the mission oh, report. Oh, oh, she just want to do the mission report. Other positions are around. She's just on a mission. She's just on a mission. Just on a mission. There are also some scholars or you say religious people. They have perception it is haram. For women to get naked in front of her husband, hmm? so you can just only cut that part near her, near her private part, and you can do sex. Seriously, you, you cannot. Okay, just take, I've, not, I've not heard of this. Take off. Her. Yeah, even the classical fukaha. Some of them said it is haram for her husband to look at the uh, at the private parts of her wife because it will make you blind. <laughs> the fukaha. I've I've read that actually. I've read that. They yeah. go, they go <laughs> I don't know what kind of laser beams are coming out. <laughs> He's like, oh. <laughs> He's like, don't blind me, woman. <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the guy. Uh, the guy was asking me like, "Why is it is haram to take shower together?" They, th they come up with th these things because the scholars have said to them that you cannot uh, take off the trousers of so your what, wife. So, what do they say about the hadith that the prophet and his wife would take a, uh, would bathe together? Would take a would take. Uh, it is haram for them to read the hadith, but <laughs> they only follow whatever the elders have said. They can't. Oh, I thought you were going to say it's haram for them to read that they can't read. <laughs> but okay, you're you're talking about taklid. They don't. Want, yeah. Mm. Most people, many muftis I've met, they are not even aware of these things. Like uh, even the hadith, they don't read it. They just read to Fatawa Shami. Mm. Or the, no, nowadays, it's so much uh, what you call jumud, the fikih jumud yeah, yeah. in the in of... the. Uh, in the stagnation, where you just a stagnation, mm -hmm. stagnation in the jurisprudence that they only read uh, the fatawa of their local scholars. Like if you are a Hanfi Deobandi, you would only read the works of Ashraf Ali Thani and Nano Tri. Mm. If you are a Bareilly Hanfi, you would only read the fatawa. Like they wouldn't even dare to read the actual Hanfi scholars, the senior ones, mm. uh, like Zaili Imam and. Uh, 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 Tahavi and the early scholars of fiqh, mm. so they don't even read them, and let alone reading the books of hadith and things like that. So where has this extra level of uh, haya, this hyper, you know, haya modesty on steroids come from? Because if it doesn't come from the Quran, was Sunnah and Islam, uh, and if you if you look at places like India, let's say Pakistan being India historically is the land of Kama Sutra and everything, but so where where has this extra 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 uh, 
शर्म और हया कम फ्रॉम ये कहाँ से आई थिंक पीपल हैव ओनली परसीव दे हैव देयर माइंड्स एंड दे हैव ओनली दे हैव ऑलरेडी मेड देयर माइंड्स दैट व्हाट एवर इज द डिफिकल्ट थिंग इज अ पार्ट ऑफ रिलीजन व्हाट एवर इज द व्हाट एवर व्हिच एवर थिंग इज एंटी डिजायर्स व्हाट एवर या Uh, it's a part of you know like the christians and jews back then used to do like celibacy yeah and they, and, and, and uh, also they, the the jesuits kind of like tr- you know whenever they feel sexual desire like whipping themselves and and sometimes they would tie this this kind of wire on their leg and and tighten it and make it themselves when i wasn't tablighi yeah. when i wasn't tablighi jamal and i was a youngster i was like a people some people came to me and i was young mm-hmm. i got inspired with the tablighi jamaat and i didn't have any much idea and that, those were the times i recently started getting bad dreams and things like that so i asked the uh, the guy who was amir mm-hmm. in tablighi jamaat what should i do about what sorry sometimes if i don't about education and bad dreams oh, that if i don't getting, do it by okay, okay. it comes mm-hmm. so it comes out so you know what he suggested me he said just take a rubber band and uh, just tie it in your um, uh, private part so it wouldn't come out even in dream what like take it <laughs> that guy comes up like he jamaat he said to me suffocate the rubber band he said suffocate the the, yeah. the the little guy down there you <laughs> kya he's like uska he uska gala daba do yaar <laughs> and i used to laugh on this because um, I, i didn't know the, that those things how back then how would that but when i grow up i how would that work i used to laugh on because you that how you'd have to tie the rubber band whilst <laughs> how does that work <laughs> you have to do in the desi way you know how they tie the rubber bands on shop on the back like three four times <laughs> and entangled <laughs> bloody hell this is uh, all in the name of in the name of islam in the name of deen really yeah mm Mm, subhanallah subhanallah so it's it's interesting actually because you know when you think about it there's there is no such thing as sexual education generally in the kind of islamic uh circles although the fiqhi texts that the islamic rulings that people read do actually cover uh like they'll be very clear on because they're classical texts on covering things like oh how the people when we talk about pornography the people accuse us of uh, accuse us of being controversial now look at their mentality the, <laughs> yeah, what's, the what, what's wrong scholars, with people ask, god damn it <laughs> when, when you ask the modern day scholars mm-hmm. uh, and you ask them is it uh, uh, allowed to do oral sex or so things like that so what they say they say this is the imitation of kuffar the- The okay, today's now, scholars or the from, classical? The present, present day, day, okay. They say this is the imitation of Kufar. Now, I, now where did they come to know? <laughs> this is the imitation of Kufar. And second thing is... They go, ye, ye, ye is, kya, yaan pe mu maar rahe ho yaan pe. <laughs> second thing is that, second thing is that, they are more concerned about watching uh, the Kufar videos instead of learning the fake books in the fake books they discuss them that abu hanifa was asked is it okay to uh, put your hand in the private parts of your wife and to uh, give her some orgasm or put your what your hand he, uh, he allow your hand, hand. Or, okay uh, your hand or, and uh, imam uh, imam malik and imam shafi and qazi abu bakr bin al maliki they discuss oral or oral sex back then of like, course of course uh, i mean this is not years, so. this is not something we so have they, invented in this day and age it's it's existed as it's long as animals do it's this i mean it's human. not something which yeah. you know no the, the this is after the imitation of kufar this is this is the imitation of animals <laughs> this is the imitation of <laughs> so they are less interested in really imitation the, of animals like <laughs> oh yaar oh, imitating animals he's going to the toilet is imitating yeah, yeah imitating this kafir <laughs> i don't i don't know which one is like the uh, how if the dogs were human they would do human style like the humans do the doggy style if um, <laughs> if, if, the, if the dogs were human they would be saying that we are doing human style <laughs> which one is the human style <laughs> which one <laughs> oh god 
Yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, very... Yeah, man, why do... As Sheikh said, that when you discuss porn, people say you're being controversial. <laughs> but, you know, people are going to say, Sheikh, they're going to say, Abdo and you're spreading indecency and immodesty. This, uh, what is your reply to, to that? Yeah, see, you have the the prophet has taught everything. Even when you go to the pro, to the toilet and what do I, you have to recite about the about the adab, about the manners of everything. He, he uh, like your sexual life is like it's like your food. You eat food, you have adab for going to the toilet. Then you have also adab for for the your sex life as well. And it's not that we only we are discussing it, but the reason when anyone discusses it gets blamed because they are telling something else. A different of a different opinion otherwise these people you go to the uh, youtube you'll see faiz ahmed mufti tariq masood malana manzoor ahmed mangal farad hashmi or so many of their scholars are uh, uh, discussing the same thing right but the only thing is in the end they say it is haram <laughs> or oh, people want it to know it's haram so uh if you the moment you discuss it and you tell that there is a other position as well position they don't want to hear it they i mean the difference of opinion. they go uh, they go conti position which position <laughs> they they have this uh, you know mentality they are already biased and prejudiced against listening other opinions Bloody they don't want to be honest this is this is what this is to be honest this is not only rationalist like you are worshiping it is kind of a worship they do uh, they do for to their scholars like they um, they don't uh, want to listen to fanaticism extremism they don't want to listen to other opinions they don't want to read they don't want to uh, tolerate this and they have grown on these mm. things they have been fed these things but for years but people years. will say look uh, sheikh if you can you know if you're going to talk about these things publicly you're going to be spreading uh immodesty and decency because the quran mentions uh, um or at least the ahadith speak of haya um the, so uh, being shu'batun min al-iman a whole portion of iman so it is from haya if you're discussing about religion Uh, I mean uh, about this. It is from the Haya. What we are, uh, what uh, like, did did not the Prophet discuss these things? Mm. Did not when they say that what if it dubar is haram, the anal sex is haram. So don't they mention the text which considers haram? Like they are also discussing it. They are also mentioning it, mm. right? Okay. So what's wrong with that? Yeah. Um. And the 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 Imam Bukhari in his um, in his Sahih mm-hmm. in Kitab al Ilm. He mentioned that two kind of people now can never uh, learn the religion: the people who are shy, mm-hmm. and the people who are arrogant. And he brought the hadith of the Sahabiya, who brought, I think, uh, uh, the uh, and went to the Prophet and discussed about her menstruation cycle. So Sayyida Aisha she rebuked her that woman, the other Sahabiya, that how dare you? I mean, how how immodest are you discussing your menstrual cycle in front of the man in front? Of her. So the Prophet rebuked Aisha. Mm-hmm. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he rebuked, and I also uh, mentioned this in one of one of my latest articles that like I posted last mm-hmm. one about the commentary of this hadith about the chapter that it is totally permissible to do, discuss these things. You know, I uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, Sheikh, but I have highlighted in the past that I don't believe uh, I don't believe. Um, I mean, this uh, the whole discussion that menstruation for women. is an impurity so i've said that look there's uh, no evidence in my understanding that it's an impurity however it has been highlighted as a rukhsa uh, but it's mentioned that women don't pray and this is actually done as an ease for them to create kind of raha uh, it's not done in the sense that they are najis or impure and there's nothing in the quran Uh, that mentions that it just mentions about the menstruation that look they go through certain pain or it can be harmful certain things obviously speaks of uh, sexual intercourse and stuff as it could be harmful i don't know if you've ever discussed this topic of uh, it's not an impurity or if you're 
um, whether your views agree with that or not. No, I didn't uh, discuss this topic. Um, I think. Sure. I know uh, you have discussed, speaking of fatawa and topics, though, you have discussed um, this thing of women as part of creating ease, doing masa over the hijab, over the khimar. So when yeah. a woman has a hijab yeah. on, she can just wipe over the actual cloth. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, this, I mean, we share some uh, a bit more on that because people might find that, one, obviously it does help many people, but they might find that a bit strange. So what? what's your... Um, this, uh, see, the Prophet did masa over his amama, mm -hmm. uh, and whilst he was wearing that. And uh, now some people may say, uh, this is for males. So now, the, now I say to them, so do you, like, for all the religion, and the Prophet was a male. Now, do you want to uh, us to find a female Prophet first at the time of the Prophet, and then you bring you an example from the female Prophet? I mean, this is ridiculous. The Prophet did amama, uh, did masa over his head, on his amama. And, and, and his wife, Umm Salama, she did on her khimar, right? Mm. So what what does that indicate? Hassan al Basri, he permitted it, yeah. right? Okay. So it's clear that it, if it wasn't permissible, they wouldn't have it done it, right? The 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 ex, ex, I mean the rulings of women, we take it from the female Sahabia, especially like they and especially the wives of the Prophet, they lived with the Prophet and they understood their religion from them from him. So the, and the, it is clear. I mean. You can do that. There's no. I I know some scholars don't allow this, mm -hmm. but what evidence they have, they don't have any evidence, and uh, this is clear. So sure. You know, I I don't know whether you once again whether you have spoken on this or what your view is. What do you the actual head covering itself covering the hair? Is this something? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, is it something that was generally... We all accept that for the most part of Islamic history, the scholars have considered it an obligation. Um, the scholars have said it is fard. However, in early, very early formative period of Islam, during the Salaf period, there seems to be some... Uh, the ambiguity on what is the overall requirement of the aura. So, for example, some people saying the arms are not included. Some people saying the hair is not included. Some people, you know, maybe for a few generations, then it stabilizes into some like, you know, what we have as the standard view. Do you agree with the standard view? Do you have some disagreements? What are your thoughts on what must be covered? Uh, on I think uh, on the other than the face, wheel, and hand, mm -hmm. uh, I haven't. Uh, what I have researched on this is that. Uh, Sorry, that's uh, my private jet. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just an aeroplane. <laughs> it's my private jet. I thought I thought I ran out of my data. So <laughs> I, I was like, <laughs> was he from. thought it's a gin. So. <laughs> I got to yes. ask you on that actually in a moment. I'll, I'll we'll go to that in a moment. But yeah, sorry, carry on. Yeah. So, what I have studied and what I have researched, I think that um, um, I think Ibn Ashur, he was the first to indicate in his tafsir about this thing, and then I think um, about Khemar, the difference of opinion of about yeah. Khemar, he indicated there are some scholars, um, but uh, I I didn't come across anyone from before that. Uh, about Khamar being, but yeah, about on face wheel, I know there's a difference. So, in some scholars try, like Sheikh Ramdi, he says, like, uh, it was a part of their jilbab, so they would cover it, mm. like, uh, like it was cultural, well. yeah, yeah. But, um, I like, uh, I'm not satisfied with this, um, with the opinion, uh, with this uh, argument, but what I have, what I have seen so far is that the, the normal position is uh, they have uh, the stronger side of the opinions or the the first uh, guy I in my research was Ibn Ashur mm. who indicated otherwise I mean the, in the 12th century yeah or, I mean uh, yeah he's from the that he's I could recent find. yeah and any unambiguous I couldn't find yeah 
Yeah, so I feel that the, you see, Ibn Ashur, he doesn't go into much of his reasoning in why he says, but this was also said about the hair. But what you do find is some of the fatawa of Imam Malik. He is discussing the hair and he mentions some dispensations. So he will say things like, oh, when the woman is with her, let's say a certain slave that she has, does she have to cover the hair? So Imam Malik said, well, certain slaves, he said, no. Now, this is where the discussion kind of arises. And he said things like uh, the father-in-law, for example, the woman doesn't have to cover her hair. She doesn't have. To. So it starts to indicate that, well, there seems to be a, uh, you know, some leeway that this seems to be more a uh, like what they call out of etic, like Kamal and not Wujub. So this is, I think this is yeah. what he's basing it on. Yeah. Yeah, in, in front of some of your uh, family members for, from, with whom you are like haram to marry forever mm -hmm. or like in front of your children or things. So then you can like uncover like, some parts of your body which are considered normal in the earth. So, um, so that is what is um, permissible or like some scholars like Ibn Hazm or Imam Azai they said if you're intending to marry someone, yeah. then you can have a look So in some parts of their body. I mean, uh, Imam so, Awza'i, uh, he said that one could look at, you know, the kind of meaty, <laughs> meaty parts of the body. But Ibn Hazm just outright yeah. went and said, you could just, just look at her naked if you want. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how that works or how one gets to that understanding. But uh, says, yeah, no, this is uh, this is window shopping, Abi. What's <laughs> window shopping, kar ke aare, eh? We just, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, right. Oh, I wanted to say about the uh, the the jinn thing. I do, I don't know what what are your thoughts on things like that. By the way, do you accept things like jinn possessions and? Um, no, no, I. A word on this as well. See, this is, um, I don't know of any evidence from the Nasus, like, or from even the Salaf, which are unambiguous or which says the jinn possession. So, many, this is all fraud. Um, the yeah. people, but if, even if you tell the people that it's fraud, they're gonna, they want to get scammed by these fraudsters <laughs> and they want to spend the money. Because it's true they, though, yeah. it, they don't, you know, the... and it's basically. And especially the, I think um, uh, I'm not uh, generalizing all women, yeah. but especially women and children. Uh, the, the women, they are sometimes, they are, you know, um, they are, uh, they have mentally, like they are psychological problems. They are unhappy with their families. Mm -hmm. so they want to go, go around, hang with the babas and the baba, they sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, karte karte, ek se hai. <laughs> so they, so well, they, there are several videos mm. where the babas are, you know, hypnotizing the women, yeah. and, and and I don't think the women are get hypnotized. This is all just fraud. They uh, engage in a consensual way, and she she wants to pretend that I'm hypnotized or the baba is taking, you know, taking care of. That's me. one of the. So that's the career to be in if you're in that part of the world. Be a yeah. jinn baba. Yeah, if you. <laughs> yeah, uh, you have like uh, job so, satisfaction. It's like, <laughs> of course, if you see people spend a lot of money, mm. like uh, uh, my, ridiculously uh, uh, huge money. To if you want to, if you want to be a millionaire overnight, become a barely and uh, tell people these stories and tell them tabis mm. and amulets and things like that. Then they're gonna be happily paying you. Yeah, like and if you say to them, I don't charge, they will pay you more. Like if now this is the new trick to convince them psychologically, you say, I don't charge. So they pay you, oh, we are, we are going to gift, giving a gift. People give, some people, the wealthy people, they give you, give, uh, gift you cars, Bangalore. Yeah, 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 they even yeah. gift you their daughters and they get you married to some, like they like too many generous people in Pakistan <laughs> and India. And even in the West, even in the West, there's so many people who buy amulets for hundreds of dollars mm. or thousands of dollars. And um, people believe in these things. So that somebody um, had said to a friend of mine that um, uh, this is a few years back that his uh, family are 
uh, you know, there's some um, hocus pocus done on them, you know, oof. you know, he said that, you know what has, uh, and you know, it's the usual has some strange things been happening and people go, ha ha, some strange things have been happening. Then they'll say like, has somebody been ill in your family? And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, my mom was ill. They're like, you know what, this is it. Like somebody's done a, a heavy spell on you. And he was saying to my friend, this is going probably, I think, about five years ago. Uh, he was saying to him, or actually more than that, it's probably a few, yeah, about maybe about six, seven years ago. He was saying to him that, well, in order to cure this, we have to send a whole tribe of jinn from Pakistan, but it's going to cost £10,000 to send them. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, give, give the, them my, are they traveling give first them my class? Number, I would do it in half. <laughs> I, I will do that in uh, half of that money. Like in five you, you'll, you'll bring them in economy it's, class. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You go, I'll fly them over in economy. Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, and you know what? They were actually on the verge of paying them. They were on the verge yeah, of doing people it. Do yeah. People were like, you know what? Okay, people just do, do it. <laughs> and I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> but this this is, damn, it's it's a big business, man. And there's so much abuse that goes on in this, uh, in this uh, industry as well of, you know, gin and saya and magic. And um, wow, it's a huge, huge, every, uh, I used to see so much. This is a huge business. Yeah. This is a huge business industry. People now, some people say, "Oh, we have experienced this." I say to them, "Your experience is not an evidence. Your experience mm -hmm. is not. I'm. I'm not forming my akida on your experience based on experience." So, people, you know, they. In my life, I haven't experienced anything such as jinn possession. Yeah. And um, because the the word jinn itself means something hidden. Yeah, exactly. And. Uh, and Imam uh, Shafa, he said, whoever claims he has seen the jinn is a kazab. His testimony is to be rejected. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And even Ibn Hazm, yeah. Ibn Hazm, he was more intelligent at that time than many of the scholars. They are like the people who direct horror movies, they don't believe themselves in the jinn. But people who, I mean, they have this concept of the jinn is, you know, having four legs, five eyes and is... Uh, uh, running here and there, doing this and that. I mean, they from where they have taken all this concept. Yeah. Most of them from the horror movies, right? From the Indian or Hollywood or Bollywood movies, and uh, they they get their concept from, and they have then super uh, superstitions, like um, jinn is on the trees. Don't go at the night. This is gonna happen. That is gonna happen. Mm. It's gonna possess you. And if you see on the YouTube, the Pati uh, Patriata Sharif uh, on the YouTube, it's literally funny. Whenever when you want to have a laugh, just watch his video. Who's this, sir? Of Patriata Sharif. Patriata. Patriata Sharif. Okay, I've not heard Sharif. of him. Yeah, in Pakistan. It's in, it's, it's in uh, Murray. It's near Murray. Okay. And uh, uh, he's taking out the chins and doing his stuff. And if you see it, you're definitely going to laugh. And people, are, people go over there, pay them and get scammed. And um, the and the the victims they are pretending to be possessed by jinns, and you'll get to know it. It's a all fraud and drama. If you see yeah. that, you'll you'll know easily because they try to speak like the jinn wants to speak German language, English language, but the jinn himself does not know German or English language. He is speaking in a, a typical Pendu Pakistani accent, <laughs> so you'll re you'll realize easily that he's trying to make it up. Mm -hmm. If he was a if he was a real jinn. He would speak, you know, in a British accent or American, like he was, or he speak German or French. Mm. But, um, but you know, something or... here, Sheikh, this brings us to this other topic. And that is that people will claim uh, ijma. People say, oh, there is a consensus uh, in matters. Now, obviously, I don't believe there is a ijma in this. Obviously, you've highlighted uh, the scholars have problematized the Ghazali had problematized Ibn Hazm clearly uh, outright, Qafal, Jassas, all these kind of great scholars. But generally, the, this whole topic of, you know, just stepping aside, this topic of Ijma, uh, people try to use it to strong arm the discussion that there is a consensus. Now, you've been vocal on this discussion in the past, haven't you, Ijma? 
So, uh, could you shed some light on? See, ijma is yeah. Ijma is dependent on kitab and sunnah. I mean, it is. Do you accept ijma? Based, by the way, ijma is dependent on. See, if you say there is ijma on five prayers or the obligation of five mm-hmm. prayers, so see the ijma is no, but the... keep aside ijma, but. The thing is that the five prayers are authentically proven by Tawatur, by so Quran, the, by Sunnah. In the, in the books of Usul, they write that the definition, the condition, sorry, not the definition. Con, the definition of Ijma, they say consensus, but the, uh, the, the conditions of an Ijma is Allah yastanida ila nas. It is not mustanid yeah. ila nas. So it's not talking about things which have a text in it. Uh, so saying that there is an ijma, that there is one God, it doesn't make any sense because we have a clear verse of the Quran saying that. Yeah, but, but the thing is that uh, even a jari, see, there is no ijma on the definition of exactly. ijma Exactly. There is no right? consensus on consensus. People, <laughs> even a jari, people, people have severally differed upon, upon the conditions of ijma. According to some scholars, the majority opinion is ijma. Mm. Right, whereas according to others, even if a single mushtahid differs, the ijma is not ijma cannot be claimed and it's not formed. Yeah. On the other hand, if you see Ibn Jarir Tabari, Ibn Taymiyyah, they said that ijma needs to be needs to have uh, evidence in the Quran or Sunnah. If there is no evidence, uh, there is no ijma. The ijma must have a dalil in the book or in the kitab or Sunnah. So if, the, if it lacks evidence, it's not it's not ijma. Like Sheikh uh, Abdullah Yusuf Al Judai, he said in his book of Usul Al Fiqh that this the definition of ijma is laid down by Fuqaha and Usuliyin. It is khayali. Yeah. It is like imaginary. Yeah. It, it, it has no existence in the real life. They say that any matter in which the people have agreed upon after the demise of the Prophet now. Claim this even in today's age and period, you cannot gather the opinions of the scholars around the world. You there are hundreds and thousands thousands of scholars who, who like millions of scholars, I'd say. They're living in the I don't know, like we you cannot claim a ijma. It's impossible. It's nearly impossible to claim ajma. It's one thing to say, to, to claim it and it's one thing to prove it. Mm. Now I'll give you example like Ibn Jarir Tabari has said Imam Shafi has opposed 300 ijma. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal claiming ijma on Fatiha al Imam, reciting uh, to uh, not recite any uh, surah, uh, not recite Fatiha behind the Imam during prayer. His own student Imam Bukhari is breaking that ijma. Mm. Imam Bukhari claiming ijma on Rafal Yadain that the Sahaba had ijma on uh, doing Rafal Yadain. His own student Imam Tirmizi is breaking that ijma. Yeah. So, I mean, you see, I have a theory that the origin, the birth of Ijma, was actually to do with uh, belief issues at a very basic level in saying um, where certain verses of the Quran apparently gave a meaning which is not what we understand. So, for example, there are verses of the Quran that apparently if you read them they imply or not imply they clearly denote they state that if you commit a major sin uh you are forever doomed you know for men uh it will mention verbs like uh, i mean there will be verses uh uh you know then he will be in nari jahannam and all of this they, and there were many other verses which the Khawarij were using to demonstrate yeah. that, look, if you commit a sin, you are a kafir. Now, yeah. those companions that were alive would have argued that this is not the inherited understanding of the Quran that we have from the Prophet. And this inherited understanding shows that even though these verses are saying this, but that's not what the understanding was. So this would have been the only valid kind of the real understanding of Ijma. 
Now, what happens within a few generations, people start shifting it from belief to fiqh. And initially, I feel there is a pushback that people like uh, Shafi'i problematizes Ijma. See, the, the interesting thing is Imam Shafi'i problematizes it in his Risala. And then Imam Ahmad says, Manita al Ijma fahuwa kathib, whoever claims Ijma is a liar. But yet, within a few um, you know, generations, it is the standard tool that everybody is trying to strong arm their opponents with. Oh, we've got Ijma in this. Um, and it's shocking. I, I think it makes a very fascinating case study to show how something can be completely baseless or you know or, or yeah. but yet become such a powerful um phenomenon i think you can use ijma as a fascinating case study but uh, yeah so i know you've spoken about that did you get a lot of slack for speaking against ijma yeah i do like um not only on ijma on almost in every second issue and uh, Ijma is one of them. Oh, and see, um, if you look at the Salafi scholars themselves, they don't believe in Ijma. And uh, like some scholars, they said they cannot be Ijma after the Sahaba. Mm -hmm. And this is what is said by Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Hazm as well. And uh, in Abdul Mannan, Noor Puvi, Abdul Salam, Bhutti, these are the senior biggest scholars of in India, Pakistan. And uh, Mughbil bin Hadi. He does not believe in the, there's even existence of Ijma. I'm not talking about modern scholars. I'm talking about traditional scholars. And they don't believe in Ijma. Mm. Uh, Ijma, to me, see, Akida is formed on the Nisus of Quran and Sunnah, on the Naf. It's not formed on the Ijma. You just can claim Ijma on anything. You need to prove from the text. If it's not proven, then it's just uh, it's an scapegoat. When you don't have any evidence, you just claim Ijma and get away with it. This is what people uh, do in every like in every other fic issue. That it's ijma. The Bareil we say there's ijma on istagasa. The Deobandi say there's ijma on against it. The Bareil we say there's ijma on prophet being new. The Deobandis argue otherwise. Like everyone have their own ijma. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, so there's ijma on jima. There's ijma. There's definitely ijma on jima. <laughs> but there's no there's no uh... Uh, ijma on ijma. <laughs> you see, this is the this is the ijma I believe hmm. that there's ijma definitely there's consensus of jima, J but not on ijma. jima is the nutty nutty. <laughs> 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 Those that don't know jima means uh, intercourse, <laughs> but it comes from the same root as the word ijma, which means consensus. So, uh, but yeah, there's a different. This is a different type of consensus, and that's a different type of consensus <laughs> right uh, i was going to say uh we can take some questions if people have any uh questions yeah i just uh i just bring my charcoal charger from the other room because it's sure, 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 I've sure. connected my it, laptop i'll be it. back in a minute go for it go for it so people if you've got any uh questions i'm thinking we can take that those of you that um Somebody said Ijma is just one letter away from uh, Jima. Yep, uh, absolutely. <laughs> it's just uh, one letter extra. That's all. Um, right. So uh, let me just see these comments, though. People behave in the comments. Um, his views on the evil eye. I will ask um, as soon as he comes, as soon as Sheikh comes back, what are his his views there are two shisha smoking is that allowed okay cool we'll see you know today there was quite a bit with the um all right sheikh welcome back ahlan wa sahlan uh i've seen more modest chats in a uh yeah people please yeah. behave in the chats otherwise i will start uh removing people from the right so sheikh ahlan wa sahlan a quick question uh first of all on um the evil eye you said about jinn possession now i did make a whole 
video highlighting that there is no evil eye in my perspective. But I wonder what you do. You accept the evil eye to some extent, or see what the main question is. What did what do you mean? Uh, what do you intend by the word evil eye? Al Ain. What do you mean by that? There is only one incident, and uh, I think that is in the narration of Abu Umama. that uh, he was doing um, he was seen by another sahabi and he fell down and then he had uh, the water of wudu or ghusl had poured over him and then he uh, came back to his senses is that not i think the sahl ibn there's, there's a sahl ibn hunayf and i think uh, yeah. amir ibn rabi yeah 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 Rabi'a. yeah that's, yeah that's the only narration i'm referring mm-hmm. to uh i think there's only one incident But people don't uh, practice which, uh, that though do they they don't ask the person with the you know the sahib on nazar to uh take a bath the main the main question is there's also dispute on the authenticity of the exactly. tradition right mm. so they see they there is sahi tradition in the bukhari muslim that the evil eye is true but what do you mean by evil eye evil eye can also mean hasad to envy to be jealous right but to mean that i am seeing you with an evil eye and something bad happens with you that there is a narration that more people in i think it's in tirmidhi that more like uh, most people of my ummah would die from evil eye but that tradition is weak that is not authentically mm. proven the meaning of what is what do you mean by evil uh, evil uh, evil eye yeah. right so that is the question that well, um, i think that if evil eye was true and hajjaj would have been died yeah yazid would have been died even the most oppressive people in this world they would have vanished away because billions of people envy them they hate them they don't have to revolt against them they don't have to fight them they don't have to vote out yeah and kick them out or you know just uh, just cast them. the so, evil eye on them uh, <laughs> yeah cast the evil eye on something so this this interpretation i'm not speaking about uh, see Uh, now people will come this this is a modernist you know this is not a modernist view from like uh, and uh, when there's no evidence to suggest this interpret is disputed mm. that you are uh, having an evil on someone uh, and uh, i don't know of any evidence or uh, i don't know if it works or not but um, i haven't um, uh, you know it's disputable sure of course it's very yeah. right let's see uh what some of the questions are people if you've got any questions you can post them whether that's facebook or youtube uh what was what's this i can't read the first part of the question somebody had mentioned something about pendu jin i don't know what that <laughs> means uh let's see cool how do you even turn on this evil eye uh it's just people they say that some people have it so they just cast it on others um were the it's just experience people one's own experience rather than a sherry mm. matter it's one's own experience uh ali has asked is shisha allowed as in smoking shisha yes if you're if you're if you're paying for it then it's definitely allowed <laughs> As long as, long as speaking of it. paying for it, <laughs> the next question is: Is muta allowed? <laughs> what are see the What are your views on this? Because muta, I have I have said, I mean, it's public knowledge that I don't believe muta is haram, but um, it, that that is a minority view. I do recognize that, but uh, what I don't know what your thoughts are on that. See the. the the narration in uh, uh, the only narration which says the motar is haram forever till the day of qiyamah till the day of judgment day it's in the sahih muslim but those wordings are disputed by the early scholars of hadith even in bukhari imam bukhari himself dis- did not consider those wordings authentic and there has been a dispute within the scholars of ahl sunnah and many scholars of ahl sunnah they have said that uh, this is a disputed matter imam ahmad bin hanbal said that i do not say it is haram mm-hmm. but i uh, so uh, they say i we we prohibit from it but we do not say it is haram because the this reason, is this is uh, who sorry uh, behind, this is imam ahmed al hanbal yeah hmm. so he said 
the reason the reason why they said this because there is no qatai evidence yeah. to forbid muta there are sunni evidences which are uncertain so imam shafi i uh, in his kitab al om he said if someone considers muta halal we do not uh, consider them deviant we do not consider that's deviant. in his kitab al om imam ya kitab al om i i translated that uh, in my post the whole uh, the whole passage imam shafi said about uh, nabees about anal sex about music and about uh, muta he said about all of these four five things that if anyone considers them halal mm-hmm. with the interpretation of the kitab al sunnah then we not consider them deviant and they are uh, they have they have they have been mistaken in understanding it but we do not consider them deviant because and he uh, argued that it is not um, uh, i mean haram with qatai evidences there is no clear evidence which makes it haram and he spoke about nabis as well you know uh, the alcohol it being other than for the grape so mm-hmm. that uh, muta is disputed amongst the uh, ahl uh, sunnah and uh, ibn taymiyah said if someone is born out of a marriage which is disputed so he he will not be a bastard <laughs> that children that he bloody bastard considered as bastard <laughs> and or uh, and the uh, scholars of uh, al sunnah also agreed it is not zina mm. muta is not mm. zina yeah it is not to be fair it would be unacceptable calling it zina um because that's not what the uh islamic literature addresses whether they agree on it or don't agree on it but still it is not um it is not that uh muta those people are asking what is muta muta is a it's it's basically a nikah but a temporary one so it's usually done with a set time frame or a set the, understanding the minimum is 3 the minimum is 3 is nights is it 3 nights no uh, i don't think it has to Bukhari. i don't think it has to be 3 nights does it have to be 3 nights <laughs> uh, i think when the prophet allowed when the prophet allowed it in sahil bukhari those scholars from ahl sunnah who have permitted this they said that needs to be minimum of 3 nights okay so, i mean i think some have said I've, that uh, they've not really discussed the any conditions with it but they've just said it's not a So the difference between it and a regular nikah is one that they set they make it clear that this is low commit it's not just low commitment it's going to end so they make that clear that's one of the most that's the most salient important feature of it and and the irony is uh, no, 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 go for it. the irony is the the the, scholars, the majority scholars of the al sunnah they allow the nikah with the intention of divorce so if yeah. a man marries a woman with the intention of divorce without without letting that woman know that he's going to divorce her it is allowed yeah they so, yeah. Uh, in the and if, so majority of the lesson scholars allow this kind of nikah but imam ahmed said this is also muta yeah because that is a form imam of ahmed, he said you know when you think about it it's like a form of this muta. is a word for, this is a word form of this is a word form yeah, of muta yeah i would agree i mean you are not letting the other person know. in in muta both the parties are agreed upon and know that when the nikah is going to be terminated but in the uh, nikah with the intention of divorce the woman is not aware of the intentions of the man when exactly he's exactly I, and i this is why that i've actually even though i've quoted in the past people like ibn abdul bar saying oh this is unanimously accepted amongst ahl sunnah i've said is way worse than an actual muta because in a muta there's just transparency and, there's just utter yeah. you know you're just being and if people have made this shia sunni yeah. thing this because of the hate of shia then this this is a sign of sunni and shia if you are if you are anti muta you are sunni mm. if you are anti uh, if you are pro muta you are no, this is a, And, and amongst and, the people uh, who uh, actually uh, permit it as well that we've mentioned already on this uh, show today tonight is uh, Ibn Ashur in his tafsir yeah Ibn Ashur he, he says said, that yeah. it's not haram but yeah so um, yeah and and another some of them also disagree there, there is a disagreement just as there's a disagreement on nikah and its conditions there's yeah. a disagreement yeah. on muta and its conditions so according to some witnesses and things like that are not necessary according to others they are they are still you know all the conditions apply the witness yeah the witness are not even um, required in the normal case yeah, i mean yeah that is, i mean there's also yeah, because there is no because the maliki madhab doesn't actually stipulate witnesses anyway it states uh some hum, yeah. some who sorry 
some hum some humble scholars they have said that if you're traveling in a journey and if if you feel an urge for a sexual desire <laughs> so you can do, marry with the woman uh, who is traveling with you without any witnesses wali and you can consume it seriously who's who said that from the humble yeah. uh i i i posted it in my um, on my facebook i forgot the name but uh, i just did it i think last year or couple of years back and they said it's it's a talfeeq of the opinions of all the scholars mm. so they said in case of necessity to prevent oneself from zina you should rather do nikah how and combine the opinion is you know this such considerate like, ulama sab mar gaye yaar koi aaj kal hai <laughs> they all seem to have died there's there is no such compassion left in no, this ulama <laughs> they, they, they practice on these things in private their own private life unless they are caught but uh, they don't want to public mm. this because they want to enjoy themselves you know yeah we have several examples interesting so then look somebody asked a question that look then what is zina what's the difference this is an interesting question i don't know what your take is on that what is the greater harm uh of zina because i uh, i mean some people i have mentioned in my pr- uh, previous q and a i have said that in actual zina it wasn't just the act there was also there were two things one was uh, the deception or the misleading nature uh, the other one was also where it was a lot of it was to do with um especially women that in that time that were married and it was referring to the adultery uh, in a lot of the cases but but i mean what i wonder what your take is on what was then because they're going to say uh, what's the a, difference that is a that is a very that is a yeah that is a very interesting interesting question and see zina is see first of all you cannot do uh, you cannot engage in any form of marriage or sexual relations with a married woman mm. right for for you need to marry a woman she needs to be uh, unmarried mm-hmm. right secondly uh she needs to be adult and third thing is mm-hmm. that when you are married with someone you have certain rights and responsibilities mm-hmm. for example if you get pregnant mm-hmm. i mean it'd be uh, a bit difficult and, uh, for you, uh, me like, to get it, pregnant chef but because i <laughs> i I've, i've heard such cases in from the western uh, so from from the western societies because when we say the conditions are not required does not mean that not they are desirable mm-hmm. let's say it in islamically it's not uh, obli it's not an obligation to re- register your nikah in the court of law but does that mean it is uh, it is not desirable it is not preferable mm-hmm. this needs to be understood because if you are not registering your nikah if you are not then you are forsaking your rights and if there is an issue of domestic violence or you of uh, later on of your you know the inheritance uh, and uh, later on you have a dispute or any anything like that so uh, the uh, the woman or even the husband they can uh, they can leave them mm-hmm. on on the on on, uh, on their own and who's going to look after them who's going to enforce all those rights and responsibilities even if you are doing muta the the state has a right to enforce certain rights and uh, legislation because uh, a few days ago uh, sorry a few months ago or maybe last year i heard of a case where uh, a, 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 a some muslim they married in community in uh, one of the european countries mm-hmm. and the lady she wanted a divorce mm-hmm. now she couldn't find anyone to get her separation and uh, her husband was not allowing her he was abusing her and he was not allowing her to travel alone uh, i mean outside going she just uh, caged her in her uh, in, his, in his house mm-hmm. and the imam the local imam was afraid to declare a divorce because the husband was uh, threatened the imam now they could they cannot also take it to the law because they are not married in the first place mm. before the court of law so there needs to be a difference see under see uh, uh, it is allowed to eat uh, certain things but that does not mean you are uh, you are uh, it's not obligatory to eat does not mean they are preferable as well you need to understand the difference mm-hmm. something is permissible does not mean it's desirable as well right so certain things are permissible but you you, you should not do it so it's better to be more safe it's, see if you are doing a transaction or engaging in a uh, in a contract or uh, doing some transactions or trade trading it's not obligation to uh, you know uh, do contract written contract mm-hmm. but 
if you don't do it and if there is a dispute later on how you are going to involve the third party the the government uh, the other parties that he has cheated on you or has betrayed you or you know taking your money mm-hmm. so this is same case with mm. the marriage divorce and so you're saying trading. that there should be the some kind of safeguarding this is what you're saying that there there should yeah, be of course. course some kind of safeguarding of uh, which ma- makes if you don't write makes sense it, and something something happens who's going to be on right okay let's see some questions somebody said um salam mufti uh i'm at mufti ami Laith. i don't know who mufti ami Laith is here hi everyone hope everyone is well okay uh right is it permissible to eat non zabiha chicken and beef uh do, do you uh, i don't know your thoughts on non zabiha meat what do, what yeah. do you, how do you see what do you how do you define zabiha meat every school of thought have different conditions mm-hmm. for zabiha meat right uh, imam ata he said that uh, ata bin abi rabah he said that if a muslim takes the name of shaitan and he slaughters the animal it is still permissible now this is, is that the actual of fatwa of ata ibn abi rabah yeah 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 what he means by that is if um, <laughs> if a muslim because he is a yeah. believer even if he doesn't take the name of yeah. god the, and he slaughters the animal it is permissible right Yeah. and uh, so the actual thing is how do you define the, someone asked me when i used to work in retail someone uh, if any muslim comes on my uh, where i was working and they would ask me like uh, if it's halal i would ask them this counter question according to who what is to what what is the definition of halal and they got confused because they don't even know what is what uh, what is mean by halal right the so certain things are disputed upon and uh, there are details on that so when you say it is not halal what do you mean by halal and what kind of conditions uh, which are no, no, known by the nusus mm. and which are not by the nusus there according is no Kadi clear mm. yeah according to qadi shokani he says that uh, there is no ijma on that and he says that anyone if, if, even if a person is not a muslim and he slaughters the animal and uh, as long as he takes the name of god it is halal even though he is a hindu right mm. and Uh, according uh, Qazi Abu Bakr bin Al-Maliki, he said in his tafsir, if a, if a kitabi, he twists uh, the, the neck of the chicken and uh, yeah. because that is according to their way and uh, then you have other opinions as well. Mm. What is considered as a kitabi? Some people count Hindu as kitabi as well. So, yeah. That was actually some of the Ahlul Hadith scholars, wasn't it? That also said, yeah. uh, was it a Mullah? Alama Rashid Rida. Who? And... Alama Rashid uh, Rashid Rida. Oh, the uh, the Egyptian uh, Rashid Rida. Yeah. Okay. He was a Salafi yeah, as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was. A, um, Did he say about Hindus? I didn't know he said about Hindus actually. He said the Hindus are the people from the people of the book as well. I thought some And, uh, Indian or uh, or Indo Pak. Yeah, Malana Wahidu Zaman also. Wahidu Zaman. That's it. Wahidu Zaman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. So right. Right, so what is going on? Let's see some of these questions. Um, do, some nutty, nutty questions here. <laughs> People are asking, somebody's asking. See, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know what it is, Sheikh. Uh, there's uh, excitement. You know? People, one of the questions is about a, if you have two wives, about a threesome. Yeah, who can I? <laughs> is this haram sheikh chalo since we've got you on the show uh in the limelight yeah haram hai halal hai ya kya hai ya mustahab hai ya <laughs> i think you can have a, a, a parda in between and then you can switch that's what you can do <laughs> why you can have a break and you can have a tag team a tag me in <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> is gambling haram? Mm-hmm. Okay. Tell Sheikh. Yeah. Yeah, gambling is gambling haram. is haram, but um, according to Hanafi, they say in the Darul Harb, the gambling is halal. But the but what what I say is that 
see uh, if you are doing gambling or uh, you know um, what um, what they say the bet betting or sports betting or gambling whatever you say if you are even the hanafis i think they have mentioned this condition if you are certain 100% sure that you're going to win then you can play it in the Seriously? in the darul haram <laughs> yeah i like that if you know you're going to win so, then play <laughs> yeah. so uh, if you know that you're going to take the money but the problem is that if you are a gambler it's not uh, it's an addiction and yeah. the one who plays, i've i've never seen a gambler uh, who, who who does not get addicted and doesn't you know lose anything and then it's uh, it has mm. its own uh, other than being haram it has also you know so many social yeah. psychological effects people get Gam- gets on road and 100% i agree with you bad- gambling is something and you should avoid it like the plague it is haram and it's like a it's like a trap you spend certain uh, amount of money you and if you want something or if you lose something to save that money you spend hundreds and thousands yeah. of dollars more mm. until you end up being bankrupt yeah you keep i have seen so many people personally they get they got destroyed because of gambling yeah. wow. so other than haram it's so not, somebody uh, had just said is ev- mufti is everything halal no here's something haram gambling However, I do. <laughs> people say, "Yar." Unless you are a hun- you know, people say Mufti doesn't declare anything haram. There you go, gambling. But you know, that said, I don't consider the you know, like the scratch cards or things like this. I don't consider that haram. Although I don't think it's a good thing, but I don't think it's haram. Like where people buy these little scratch this cards is, and this stuff is like a, this. The uh, people are so. or playing so the lottery among... for example i don't think yeah, that's are... haram yeah. but i just i don't think it's a good thing but it's not haram uh, i don't consider that to be the main like gambling is like what happens in casinos and you know actual gambling which has the addiction and the whole uh you know where it ruins lives you know playing a weekly lottery or the lotto or raffle tickets at a fair or something these things are not in my understanding that gambling that's 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 what or you're playing with your friends yeah. and if you say if it's uh, if you's gonna you're gonna have me dinner yeah yeah or if you're gonna have me meal this this kind of things are not gambling yeah. you know for sure somebody yeah. asked um uh doc uh sheikh kashif i don't know where they get this impression but they were wondering whether you were a quranist uh and of course sheikh kashif is not a quranist sheikh kashif is actually from the ahl hadith uh movement so which is actually to do with hadith but for some reason they must have i don't know why they asked that question whether you were quranist mhm i i don't and and i don't even call the quranist people quranist to be honest and um, i don't understand from i like people i i have seen people traditionally who consider considers me modernist i have seen modern people they consider me tradi- traditionalist so like you cannot make everyone happy no. you, i have uh, several times stated on my facebook or they could they can ask me like, like he's asking but i'm i'm not a quranist by the way you in rejecting the traditions and things like that i don't do that but uh, people assume it because when i differ with them they start assuming that oh no you are have become a, this is just how you define a word but uh but i don't Some, think uh, yeah most the huh? mufti mufti amilaith <laughs> abe kon hai ye sala ye sala mufti amilaith acha 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 so they've asked how do i reach the pleasure of allah azza wa jal ayo azza wa jal right so uh, and also somebody has asked how does one reach wilaya Hmm I don't know do you have thoughts on on this Sheikh Kashif if somebody wishes to attain wilaya what does that mean and you know I mean people have different understanding of wilaya and uh, they want to reach I mean you you can be a good pre- if you keep your uh, um, keep yourself healthy and keep yourself make uh, happy in a good environment and around good people and I think that is what it mean by the wilaya according to me because if you look at the uh, the definitions every scholar has a different uh, uh, definition of wilaya right 
so if you are being if you are being honest with yourself being dutiful and fulfilling your obligations and uh, being in the company of the right people and making yourself happy like you are in this world enjoying your life uh, uh, and uh, go doing your this is vilaya um, and you are being like vilaya means the friend of allah mm. and uh, things like that so um if you're not keeping yourself happy you people like you know they get frustrated psychological problems they start hating their life then they start hating religion they don't they don't want to work just keep yourself busy uh, enjoy a happy life being be good with your family mm-hmm. so the Al- allah has created you to enjoy this world explore the world wow. enjoy with your family pray and this is what allah means and spending a, a, the sahaba he saw a man coming and he said what would not it be better if he has spent his life in the way of allah or he has sacrificed his life in the way of allah the prophet uh, uh, rebuked rebuked the sahaba and he said the one who works for his family he is in the way of allah yeah. the work the one who spends on himself he is in the way of allah the one who spends on his family he is uh, 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 doing it on the way of allah i mean the, the charity itself is spending begins from spending on oneself yeah. it not begins at home and it's really about becoming yeah. a uh, trying to become a decent human being this is really yeah. what this this kind of understanding of uh, tazkiya or this understanding of uh, yeah. really is that's what it truly your relatives your relatives and your uh, your uh, your neighbors are safe from your tongue and from your harm yeah. and the prophet said the believer who in do, who mixes with the people and tolerates their um, you know hardships and difficulties or abuses is more better than the one who uh, gets away from the people you know yeah. so be- because when you are in this world you have to deal with a different kind of people yeah. so uh, it's better to interact with the families and uh, your neighbors and socialize with them and enjoy your life wow. yeah that's it. amazing advice sheikh right with that we'll bring this to to an end it's been absolutely epic some people have asked uh about what is the best way to connect with sheikh kashif sheikh what is the best way uh for people to reach out to you to connect is it facebook uh because you are active on facebook yeah i'm active on facebook but um, i always want to um, sorry because sometimes i'm unable, I'm unable to uh, reply is because um, sometimes i'm very busy because i'm working full time mm-hmm. and um, so sometimes um, um, it happens like um, i'm tired or not able to reply to because it's when you get so many messages sheikh mm-hmm. just froze there for a moment sheikh just frozen <laughs> all right sheikh you're doing it you're frozen in time i don't know what that is but what i'm going to do is since we were going to wrap this up anyway there's no point rebooting the entire thing i'm going to share sheikh kashif's um link to his facebook page on in the description on youtube so if you haven't already checked out his page do that do you can subscribe and follow uh his page he does share a lot of interesting articles other than that guys it's been absolutely awesome once again it's we've had some very interesting and one may say controversial topics <laughs> but guys much love wherever you are i do uh well we can just see well 